We are so happy that everyone is here, and the students are really excited. They've, I mean, we've all learned a lot you know, from this process, and uh, thanks again for coming. So, Jamie, you want to say a few words? Welcome everyone. I'm Geneva Overholzer. I'm the I'm the uh, editor of the journalism school. I'm the, uh, <coughs> ah yes, those were the days. I'm the director of the journalism school here at Annenberg, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you with us. I think it is very accurate to say that I have been dreaming of this day from the moment I set foot uh, in my office here at Annenberg. I have yearned to get together a group of students from Viterbi, our fine <coughs> engineering school, and from Marshall, our fine business school, and from Annenberg, obviously, our fine journalism school, to just have them think about the future of journalism. And here it is. I want to thank the uh, Spencer family, Cardi and Nancy. Hello, Cardi and Nancy, when you see this tape. They are the ones who made this possible through a generous uh, gift to Annenberg. I want to thank Dana Chen, who is the one who actually made it happen. She's just really taken it and run with it. I want to thank all of the faculty, including preeminently Tom O'Malia, Mr. Entrepreneurship of USC, who has, without whom we could not have had it, because he not only is the spirit of entrepreneurship, but is our rich link um, to Marshall. Certainly Robert Niles, without whom it couldn't have happened. Vicki Porter, who runs the Night Digital, Boot, Boot Camp, Night Digital Media Center Boot Camp, which uh, collaborated last week with this, Amy Guerin, Nani de la Pena, <coughs> wonderful faculty. Obviously, Sophie, you who make all things possible. I want to thank our partners, the Los Angeles Times, the Orange <coughs> County Register, Freedom, and Southern California Public Radio, KPCC. And of course, I want to thank the students. This, uh, to me, speaks to the future of journalism in a way few things do. You know, Clay Shirky has famously said when thinking about what, well, what, what does the future hold, he says nothing works but anything might. Everything might, whichever one it is. And if you ask me, a few words really speak to what the future is going to look like. Whatever else we may know about it, I'm willing to bet a lot that it's going to uh, be collaborative, uh, it's going to be about partnerships, it's certainly going to be about innovation. It's going to be about risk-taking and entrepreneurial thinking. And uh, that's what this event speaks to. So I'm thrilled to welcome you. I'm really looking forward to your presentations. And now I want to introduce my boss, Dean Ernest Wilson. Thank you, Geneva. And it, uh, uh, it really is a delight to see all of you in this room this morning. It is. Uh, you bring a little sunshine to an otherwise uh, June gloom day, um, and it really is a delight. I just want to say a couple of things. One is that um, what you're seeing today is part of an initiative that the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism has been thinking about for several years now. And as, as Geneva so aptly said, in some ways, this is the culmination of everything that we've been working toward. And it has sort of three major parts. One, we've been trying to uh, work internally inside the school to get ourselves organized to be able to do this kind of, uh, uh, of this kind of work. And it really is not just an organizational question. It is a question of, of uh, changing the culture, of leadership, and of really of spirit. And I think that um, uh, it's a pleasure to see the spirit of our students and of our faculty and leadership um, working inside the school. Uh, secondly, it's about collaboration between our school and other schools on campus. As uh, again, Geneva said, with Marshall, with Viterbi, but also with the arts schools, with the provost's office. Um, so that's got to happen as well. And then thirdly, this is part of our broader effort to reach beyond the campus, to reach out to our colleagues at the uh, LA Times, at the Register, and other uh, companies. Um, John Seeley Brown said recently that, um, that innovation takes place at the intersections. There's some in innovation at the core, of course, but it's, it's at the edges, it's at the intersections of disciplines, at the intersections of professions and schools and communities of thought where the greatest new ideas are, are going to come from. And I am confident today that um, we're going to see that in action because this is a team of people who are comfortable working at the intersections of these three great disciplines and professions and schools. Um, Alan Kay, some of you who may know that no, name, who um, 
was one of the people who invented the mouse and, and did a lot of work on human-computer interaction. Uh, he said that the best way to understand the future is to help invent it. And I think what we're seeing today is that you're helping to invent the future. And when you do that, you will understand it better. And for those of us who will have the privilege of uh, looking at your presentations today, uh, I think we'll also learn a little bit about the future uh, because we have been watching you invent it. So I especially want to say to our, uh, our, our colleagues who've come in today from our partners, uh, KPCC and Freedom and others, thank you for coming in. We hope this will not be the last time uh, you come to the school. We look forward to collaborating with you in the future. And uh, to our contestants and... and, and, and <laughs> Uh, good luck with this, and let us know what happens in five years. <laughs> Come back and let us know how you have invented, reinvented the world. So best of luck to everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Ernie. Uh, we're going to start out with five on five, which is five minutes about five things that we think that, oh, no, I guess... <laughs> I guess, so, yeah, I thought I had an intro slide, but no. Five things that we think that all news organizations should know about mobile. We're going to start out with a WAP, Wireless Access Protocol, and I asked Kevin to do this because Kevin is from Marshall, and we all know the Marshall students, you know, they're, they're practical, they see all the aspects, and they're not, you know, overwhelmed by the, the glory and the, the fun that is iPad and all this other stuff. So, Kevin, take it away. Much as uh, Geneva's uh, dreamt of this day, uh, I think you all have dreamt of learning about best practices <laughs> for a while. So uh, I'm going to try to deliver, try not to reinvent too much, but really uh, just talk a little bit about WAP. But what is WAP? It's a wireless application protocol. It's just, uh, it's just an application layer for the wireless environment. Really what it is, is just simplifies it so that on a small screen or uh, a screen that's a little bit tougher to navigate, the experience is richer. So you can see, these are the types of phones that should be targeted for WAPs. They're not the, the iPhone that I have in my left pocket, it's the feature phone, as we call them, or clamshell, if you have the other type model. We've all had them before, we all understand what we are, or what they are, we just know that there needs to be a different experience. But why? You can see here, there's two ways to interpret this graph. This is the installed base, the percentage of folks that own a mobile phone, here are smartphones. This is from November 2005. You can see to about six months ago. About one in five are soon going to own a smartphone. But there's still a significant gap between smartphones and feature phones. So what I choose, how I choose to interpret this graph is, yes, we need to be uh, innovating in the smartphone area, but we can't ignore the over 80% of the installed base of mobile users that are still using feature phones. Uh, beyond that, before we look at exactly what a WAP site is, some of the reasons why you want a WAP strategy. Because these feature phones, they have small screens. You can't fit the same amount of content on there. It's tougher to navigate these phones. You don't have the, the touch screen on a lot of these where you can scroll back and forth. It's often just an arrow and, or, or a roller bar. On top of that, the load times take too long. No one wants to get on their phone and spend a minute waiting for a big image to download or to be able to understand what's going on uh, on a video. Uh, in addition to that, and a very important piece is the fact that most feature phone owners don't have a real exorbitant data plan. They don't want to be sifting through their phone for some basic information and realize they just paid $5 for that information because they weren't set up with the right data plan. So really the biggest challenge in developing a website is, the, is balancing the number of features you can offer with the navigability of those features through that experience. So to give you an idea of what a website looks like and how it contrasts to a normal website, this doesn't look like much if you were to pull this up online. This is ESPN's website. You can see on the next slide, this is their website. Go back a second. WAP, web, WAP, web. Can you imagine putting all of this information on this phone? Do you think that's going to fit very well on this right here? You think that's going to be a fun experience? It's going to be tough and I'm going to get charged way too much for what I want to do. So what I've developed is something... Keep going. 
That was way too loud. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't realize we got both speakers. Uh, but uh, I developed a little thing uh, I call the Ten Commandments of Websites. You have to understand it's not your parent website. You've got that point across for the reasons that I discussed. Secondly, you need to address your organizational structure. So while you may have, if you go to the next part right here, just quick data up top. If people are going to their, their feature phone, website, maybe they just want to know the weather tomorrow, maybe they just want to know the traffic right then. So if you put um, quick access points on the top, that'll be better, and navigational tools on the bottom, which we'll get to in one of our commandments, that serves you better. Important content needs to be front and center. Where a lot of folks like to put important content on the top, maybe on the right, where naturally those hot zones go. On a feature phone, you're not looking at the top, you're looking at the front and the center, so put your important content there. Three clicks deep, max. You don't want to have content that you have to go more than three clicks because people will bail out, they will not want that experience. Avoid large images for the data uh, download time that we talked about and because of the data plans that are cost prohibitive. 20 kilobytes per page, max. For the reasons we discussed, you don't want to have too much data on one page. Vertical scrolling only. Most of these phones, you can't scroll horizontally very easily, so you want to be, just have one motion up and down, whether it's touch, an arrow, or a roll bar. Navigational tools on bottom, as I mentioned, but most importantly on a website, search. You've got to have the search feature. That little magnifying glass with the box next to it makes it much easier to bounce around from page to page. Text only option. Maybe people don't want to see any pictures. Nothing. Just give them the option, just give me the bare bones, black and white, A to Z. And like and comment features. This is an interactive experience, the mobile experience. You want to be able to give them something unique to what they might not get in a newspaper or they might not get online. They might get that online, but they want to do it on mobile as well. If you don't, end up looking like tombstones. <laughs> <laughs> so really what this means, that these, these best practices um, are important because they're going to address the needs of the feature phone users, which as we saw, is still 80% of the installed base of mobile devices. If you address these needs, they're going to have a richer experience. They're going to appreciate it. They're going to come back more often. They're going to stay longer. And all that funnels into the all-important loyalty. And that loyalty translates into the opportunity for some revenue streams. Maybe some mobile ad sales. There is an opportunity there. I have some graphs I can show you that show the opportunity that's there. If you have a loyal customer base, they see the value, they want to stay, they don't mind if some ads are served on a WAP site or an application. Thank you. Thanks. Um... Oh, there's one more slide. Yeah, there's one more slide. <laughs> but you can probably Which would you rather choose? Which would you rather browse? <laughs> Rob, Rob. On a phone. On a phone, right. On that phone. All right. So now we're going to talk about different mobile operating system trends. And I've asked Jason from Viterbi to talk about this because uh, Jason came into my office uh, once and talking about this. And actually, and Kevin Lou did too. And it was just sort of like, Danny, you've got to see the droid. I'm like, why? <laughs> and so now all of a sudden, it's like, I want the droid incredible. So, and why? Because I have an iPhone, but it's time to move on to Android. So. Jason, you want to come up and talk to us about that? Okay. Uh, I had a first slide, but it's gone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about operating systems, mobile operating systems, and the current state of mobile operating systems is one that is very fragmented, but led by OS X, which is the Apple's operating system. And they've been able to get ahead or get an edge in this market because they have three major components that none other of these uh, competitors were able to provide from the get-go. And those three are, first, for the developers, they created a great software development toolkit. And with that, they were able to create a great consolidation of applications where people can go and find applications. And lastly, they were able to make a good payment plan, very simple to use, and easy account management system that none of these other providers were able to provide. And now, Apple is on the top. BlackBerry, on the other hand, they have a more business user base. And they're going to stay there 
in the BlackBerry area because BlackBerry offers great email systems, security that corporate America needs, and BlackBerry offers that very well. Symbian, which is the largest provider globally today, is not a big provider in the United States, so for the news organizations, it may be a kind of a side that you should worry about later. And Android, the newest provider today, they've been really increasing their market share recently. And they have a very different strategy from the Apple system, and they have three different strategies. One is having an open system where developers can openly look at their source and develop applications. Second, it's free. And lastly, they have a very good, loyal development base or developer base. And the way they were able to create this is by creating opportunities like the $10 million to develop an, an entrepreneurial application or creating the um, mobile open mobile alliance which is able to create an alliance of 65 different companies of phone companies and also developing or development uh, software development companies. So with this, Android is really growing. And the last app OS I want to talk about is Windows OS, which also similar to the BlackBerry has a business user base, but is not doing so well. However, they do have very specialized user bases, such as the medical community. And Windows offers very specialized applications for those specific users. I want to go on to the next slide. So knowing what we what I talked about from the previous slide, we can see that the Symbian is going to start decreasing a little bit and Android accelerating to a very big size, actually bigger than the iPhone. And this is based on a source, Gardner. And we can see that for news organizations, we really want to emphasize on these four areas. Symbian may be something that you want to go after later, but definitely you need a three-fold plan. First, you need to have a website. And as Kevin talked about, a very user-friendly website that's going to target the BlackBerry RIM and the Symbian. Second, you need to have an Apple app. And that's going to go to the phone, iPhone. And I think a lot of the news organizations today have this going right now. But I do think that some, maybe uh, my specific organization, doesn't have an app for the Android. And this is an area that you will really have to emphasize on in the next three years because it is going to come up and it's going to come up fast. And this is only one source gardener, but similar research has been done from other prestigious research centers and they have predicted a very similar scenario. So that's all I have. If anyone has any quick questions, I can answer that. Is that Symbian number worldwide? Yes, th this is a worldwide number. Right. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Lori, you had a question? Why do you think that Android has been able to not just catch up, but surpass iPhone so quickly? Google has a very interesting strategy. They value the developers more than the users, so their idea is to get those applications out there. Once the applications are there in place, then the users will follow. So, Different yeah, okay. and those are one of the reasons why the BlackBerry has a touch phone and also the Palm Pre has a touch phone. They are not doing so well because they weren't able to give those apps up front to the customers. They get the phone and they say, oh, this, well, why did I get this phone? I should have gotten the iPhone instead. It has so, many more to offer, so much more to offer. So yeah, that's the reason. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, another unique thing about mobile phones is both the geolocation and the social media aspects of it. And Foursquare is one of those new things that's come up. And Becca came to me, we were walking back from the wonderful sessions that Vicki Porter had with uh, the Night Digital Media Center over at Popovich, which is a nicer classroom than this one, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I love those classrooms in Popovich. But uh, Becca's like, Dana, have you been on Foursquare yet? It's like, uh, no, and then she proceeded to tell me all about it. So I asked Becca to go ahead and say what she said to me as she was explaining what Foursquare is and why it's important to her. Yeah, so now I'm going to tell you guys about it. Um, so how many of you guys have actually checked in here this morning? Woohoo! Awesome. <laughs> okay, well, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, Foursquare is a social media service, but um, it's location-based and it's also kind of a game. 
and um, I use it. I check in wherever I go, and I can get reviews of places that are around me wherever I check in, and I can see where my friends are, and it's really cool. My best friend is in New York City right now, and um, I can see wherever she is in the city from here in LA, which is kind of neat. Um, but the main point is, news organizations can use Foursquare too. And you guys, I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about that today. Um, you can inject some of your editorial content into it and, use, and also use the geotag to tag stories that are relevant to uh, places instead of just, you know, online or paper um, or on the phone. So, and you can also partner with businesses um, and help advertise deals and promotions that they may be having through Foursquare. And how can you do this? Well, the way Foursquare works is when you check into a place, um, you're going to instantly you're going to earn points. And these points don't really mean anything. It's kind of the fun aspect of the whole service. Um, at least right now, they don't mean anything in the future. Um, I kind of see them adding up to deals or, you know, like, I think Foursquare wants to partner with businesses and kind of create deals out of the points. If you get a, reach a certain number of points, like, maybe you'll get this amount off of this product. So that's kind of where Foursquare sees itself going in the future. But right now, the points are new badges, which are just kind of fun. There's, like, if you check in a certain number of times, or a certain like, type of venue, you can earn whatever badge. And if you check in enough times to one place, you can also become the mayor of that venue. So that's kind of fun. And when you check in, um, you see who else is there, like right here. Um, and then you also see that Courtney Lewis is the mayor of Agua Cafe, which is just kind of a fun aspect of it. Um, and Starbucks actually has partnered with Foursquare and they have a barista badge, so if you go to Starbucks a number, a certain number of times, you become a barista there, which is just kind of cool. And a couple other businesses have badge type rewards like that too. Um, and then another way that um, businesses are kind of using Foursquare, uh, the New York Times, for example, in New York, when you check in somewhere, um, you get instant access to New York Times reviews of places that are also around that location where you check in. So that's really cool, and I definitely advise all of you news organizations to get on that because if you establish yourself like as a user persona on Foursquare, that could really you know build your credibility and re reliability. Um, and also with deals and promotions, you can as news organizations you can help promote these deals like within your publications, which would be great for both the business and you and potential advertisers. And um, reporters are also using Foursquare uh, kind of as citizen journalists. Like, um, let's say for instance, a subway user, um, or I guess kind of like a subway reporter, someone reporting on the subway in traffic, they could use um, Foursquare to see who's on the subway, what they're saying about it, because when you check into a place, you get tips about uh, dining attractions, but you also get, you know, kind of funny blurbs, like Amy was saying that she checked into a restaurant and she got a little anecdote about something funny that happened there the night before, which, you know, it's just kind of another form of getting word out and making shout outs about different things. Um, but yeah, so I think that if news organizations really take an interest in Foursquare and help promote it and help make it thrive, that it could really become the location-based social media of the future, which would help both you and Foursquare itself. So, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Thank you, Becca. questions actually. Um, did you look at all into the Facebook location that's coming out? Because that's going to be coming out in the next few months. And then yeah. the other question was, um, you know, for how to sell these deals to advertisers when they're already being pitched for, you know, just such an array of products, why do you think they would choose Foursquare as where to put their money? Um, well, I can see them wanting to use Foursquare just because it's really personal. Like they're gonna directly reach like however many people are checking in. So 
I mean, I think that's a really good selling point that you, I mean, if a business per se, if they're gonna, if you're gonna partner with a restaurant um, and it's a really popular and a lot of people are checking in there, then you know that it's gonna be a successful ad. Um, and then the Facebook one, I, I did read a little bit about that and it doesn't seem like they have a definite plan. I know they're thinking about like definitely putting geolocation like into their um, future, but um, they don't. They're not as solid as Foursquare right now about it, and I don't really think they know how like exactly they're going to incorporate it. But I think it would be really successful with Facebook to add that onto Facebook, just because Facebook's already mobile. It's on the iPad. It's on everything. So I mean, that would definitely be competition for Foursquare. But I think Foursquare is great just because it's easy. It's not. Facebook has a lot of different applications, and this is just about location, which I think is really cool, and I think that will ultimately set it apart if Facebook gets the geolocation, too. Great. Thank you, Becca. Uh, next, Nani de la Pena, who's a senior research fellow here at Annenberg, introduced the whole group to QR codes, which, of course, I had to then Wikipedia it and say it's a quick QR means quick response. So I asked one of our engineers to explain exactly what a QR code is. So it's Ravenan. Hi. Uh, I welcome you all to this forum where we are discussing how there's going to be a transition from the print industry to the mobile and iPad applications as such. <coughs> so let me get started with some of these questions that have been plaguing the print industry. Why couldn't the print industry actually capitalize on the highly successful internet model? Were the print industry afraid that they would lose on the local physical newspaper subscribers when people start using content online, which is kind of free? Or is it because advertisers are moving away from print? They really don't know who are the people who are viewing their ads on the print. They have no analytics in terms of whether those print ads are actually getting converted to physical buy. In terms of users also, there's a lot more interactivity available with other mediums online. For example, you want to watch a video, a video tells a lot more about the story than just creating plain content. So the solution that I propose today is something called the QR codes, the quick response codes. And since Google and Microsoft are also betting really big on this, I think it will be really worthwhile to see what it's all about. So uh, QR codes essentially is very simple, just like our barcode system. A single, a small image, white and black. What essentially happens is this, this QR code is free to generate, so you really don't have to invest in anything. There are a lot of softwares online. The prominent one is called Zebra Crossing. You can just feed in your data, it'll generate a code for you. So the way this works is you, imp you implement a part of this QR code and stick it up right next to your article in the newspaper. Any feature phone camera or smartphone camera or even your computer webcam can translate this QR code into web URLs, live audio streaming, video streaming, more interactivity for ads, and even getting user input data. So I'll just give you a small demo as to how this actually works and further explain. Hi, I'm David Granger. I'm the editor-in-chief of Esquire magazine. I'm here to introduce you to the augmented reality issue of Esquire. Before I say anything more, let me just kind of show you. Ah! Oh yeah! In your face! And bless your soul. Welcome to the Augmented Back. Reality so Issue Robert, of Esquire Magazine. My home? name is... That's Robert Downey Jr. There are a variety of experiences you can have that all enabled by this little marker on the front of the magazine. Hold it up again. Ah! Tilt it oh, forward. Yeah. This will hitherto be only known as the home invasion portion. In fact, there are a number of experiences that you control. So this is how simple this is, and the code that you saw is free to generate. So there's not a lot that you have to invest in terms of infrastructure. The only bottleneck for the moment is feature phones also need a software that needs to read these codes. It is already available with all the smartphones, the iPhone, the Blackberry, the Androids, the Windows phone. All these phones do have it. The computers got software to read it as well. So I see this as a potential transition where you would engage your print audience to also go on to online. So this can be a very smooth transition rather than say, hey, jump online, everything is going there. You would have 
apprehensions about who would buy the iPad to actually read your content. This could be the way forward for you. So, uh, I would like to talk about some cases here where this thing could actually be very useful. For example, let's talk about our advertisers. So, we have this ad about the Honda Civic or a new car that's coming up. And you stick this code right next to it. And when a person takes a picture on his smartphone, this directs to an interactive app or a website where he can actually start changing the colors of the car, see what the interiors look like, even try for some performance measures, what would be the way it performs and stuff like that. Further on, he could go and buy it directly from there. So, as far as advertisers are concerned, this would give them analytics. Hey, okay, this is the newspaper, people kicked here, and this is where I am. I'm getting my users. For you, a very good revenue stream because you would get a commission on direct selling. So this would be one way, so your advertisers really don't have to jump off to the iPad. So it can be a very nice transition. Let's talk about the content itself. Let's talk about a video. David Beckham scores an awesome goal. I mean, how, how much can you really write about it? Instead, stick up the QR code up there, it'll take you to the video, show what the environment was like, a more immersive and a more engaging uh, experience for your audience as well. This could even further translate on to real-time advertising, where you start putting up ads and stuff like that for your audience. A uh, couple of people have already implemented QR code. The Japanese are doing it since 1994. So this technique is something that's really, really well proven. Uh, if you walk into Japanese cities, you will find them all over the place, right from restaurants to billboards to newspapers, magazines. It's a whole lot engaging and it's a very well proven technique as far as they are concerned. Right now in the United States, we have City Search uh, tying up with local restaurants in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we walk up to the restaurant and you click a CQR code, you take a picture of it, it's going to give you information on what the restaurant is about. Also act as a local tour guide for them. So people can actually start engaging. So advertisers are definitely moving on to this. And I see a very good potential for the print medium to also implement this and kind of form a bridge between your look, your print uh, audience as well as your online audience. Subscription can equally follow. So there is quite a lot of revenue models for that. I would be glad to explain that soon. So just to wrap it up, I think this is a very good transition for people to move from the print to the online digitized world. So I'd like to have any questions. Um, I'd like you to compare and contrast the value of a link versus a QR code. I mean, what's the difference? Are QR codes the, the links for the real world? You cannot click a link on the newspaper. And then for them to actually start copying the newspaper, typing it on the browser, and going there, it's going to take time. Once you just pull out your phone, snap it up, it's going to directly take you there. And the whole thing is immersive. With the iPad coming in, I'm sure the next edition is going to have a camera as well. Now we can judge on Apple, but then still. So, and it's very easy, there's not technology, it's, it's already existing technology. Feature phones are going to have the software soon. So that's what I see. What do you think is going to be, what do you think is needed beyond just people getting smartphones? Because people with smartphones aren't adopting QR codes because, you know, the simplest processes involve, you know, maybe seven steps if you don't already have an app that is compliant. I mean, you, you don't really have to have an app for this because, uh, and as far as smart, smartphones are concerned, it, it's just like a web-based model, so you click on the QR code, it's going to throw up a web URL, a mobile URL as well as if you like it, and it's just going to redirect you to the site where you have this thing up running. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and feature phones are also going to benefit from that because it's not a lot of software, it's a very small piece of software that you need to get it up running. Mm -hmm. So it's a system that would work well with anything that's got a camera. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it is, it's going to just span across a lot of multiple platforms. So you really don't have to think about what happens with respect to iPad, what happens to the Android market, what happens to Blackberry, what happens to the feature. It's all up running for all the platforms. Did you do any research into the QCAT, which was a tool? <laughs> exactly. Um, the QCAT was this, this device, it was a specific device, it was almost like a mouse. Okay. Like you plugged it to your computer and you could scan a barcode on a newspaper page and it would bring up the additional material. Now granted it was a specific single use device, yes. um, but it didn't seem to take off at all. Yes, that's, 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 that's because uh, people have to invest in hardware, which is again expensive, <laughs> and the barcode, there's a lot of information. If you see the QR code, it's a, it's a square, and the amount of information you can embed in a QR code is much higher than what a barcode can read up for you. So barcode essentially only for prices and 
to see the inventory tracking, but this can have video. I mean, you just saw that we have video, a lot more engagement. Okay. So that's where I see. Did you look at, you know, in terms of the audience, the audience profile of the newspaper reader mm -hmm. skews much older. Um, they're less technologically adept okay. in the general population than people who, you know, the younger generations who would be more comfortable with this. So did you look at, look at the behaviors? Yes, we did look up our behavior with respect to old people using it. I mean, in fact, we did see a bird. <laughs> I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but then I was like, okay. the newspaper reader is of a certain age. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. So uh, the point I was trying to make is, I did come up and see a video yesterday of a hundred year, hundred year old person being very happy with the way the iPad was interacting. Uh, the way she could interact with the iPad. So uh, it, it depends on engagement, right? So if, uh, for example, when people are on the move, reading content is going to be difficult. Whereas they have this thing, answer a bit up, a video is going to just play, it's going to be lighter, laid back experience. Probably if they do find it very engaging, there's a lot of scope for the market. Um, did you look at specific advertising? You know, I, I see this as having more, you know, the Esquire example you gave was a parlor trick. They did it because they could. And that's not a very good reason to do things for readers because, you know, you, you invest this, you know, amount of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the people on this panel have dwindling amounts of money. So it's, in terms of, you know, uh, do you see this having more application around advertising than you do around content? I say, uh, like, like I said, the amount of money you would have to invest is not much because the technology is already there. You have to in invest, that Esquire thing was an investment in man hours, mm -hmm. uh, design, and money. That was an expensive thing for them to produce. So, you know, yeah, it's the technology okay. end of it is great, very easy. Mm -hmm. The implementation end, which falls on dwindling editorial staffs, okay. even for advertising. Okay. Let's face it. You know, so, you, you, my bet would be that it would be more, a, there would be more benefit for the advertising than okay. really for the content. Content part of it. Okay. Because I, I, I can't tell you how many redirects that I've put in the paper that have been wrong. Oh. And uh, have gotten looked at the redirect usage and one or two people used it. Okay. So I, I, you know, did you look at that angle? I did see because uh, with respect to the, ad okay, so advertising is essentially what drives revenue as far as content providers are concerned. You get no argument from me there. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I see a potential where, for example, Amazon and FedEx are also using this in terms. So it, it is pretty precise. and. As far as I'm concerned, Sydney Herald is a newspaper back in Australia which is using this kind of services. So I think as the economics of scale, a lot more people start using it, then I would say people would bet on this technology and that would die in size and provide you more interactive experience and such. But yeah, I would look up more detailed information for you of course. Great. Thank you so Thank you. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the iPad, finally. <laughs> kind of thing. So since Freedom asked specifically to look at iPads and only iPads, and we're going to have the Freedom team present about iPads, and Drew Prickett is leading that effort. So, Drew. Great. I guess it is the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, <laughs> who here owns an iPad? And who here brought their iPad with them? Um, this has been a really interesting topic for us. One of the, the best things about this will be for us is the opportunity to interact with some of this technology. Uh, we had multiple phones, brand new phones, brand new iPads that we got to work with. And just in terms of uh, my presentation today, three main points I want to bring up regarding the iPad. First of all, I'm going to give that to you. Um, the next slide, please. When you think about the past, present, and future of tablet computing, it's all now. So when you think about, you know, three months ago, the present three months ago, you're thinking about e-readers, Amazon's Kindle, you know, it's already changed to the iPad, and then in a couple of months from now, we're going to have uh, new technology from Dell, for example, I'm sure some of you saw in the paper yesterday, 
or two days ago, next slide please, that the Dell streak's coming out later this summer. So what does this mean for you? You gotta be fast, you gotta be nimble, you gotta be able to understand how readers, how advertisers all are all interacting with these different types of technology, what the challenges are, and how advertisers think about them as well. Second main point, there's no substitute for actually getting your hands on one of these and interacting with it. And I think I speak on behalf of most of us in the group here, we were a bit skeptical of the iPad before we actually got our hands on it. And so how do you turn someone from a skeptic to someone who's going to advocate for it? There's no substitute in getting it in their hands. And for us, in our, in our group, uh, really we had a moment. We had an <laughs> iPad moment where you know, we were sitting in a room, weren't really sure you know, how this was going to take off, how we were going to actually use it. We pulled up the Wall Street Journal site and looking at it, it was like, wow. We can envision ourselves paying for this. We can envision ourselves reading this every day. You know, there's value in this. Potentially more value than actually reading a paper version, which is a pretty powerful statement when there's people in our group from the print journalism side from Annenberg. Third main point is, you know, the, the, the question that keeps getting thrown around in the news is, is the iPad the savior of journalism? You know, is this technology really gonna you know, provide new revenue streams, new opportunities, to, to boost your industry? And uh, the, the collective answer is, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's great from uh, an interaction side, it's great from a uh, reading side, but in terms of content creation, still not there yet. So it really depends on how your users are actually interacting with it. And we'll get more into this in our, in our next presentation when we work with Freedom and the Orange County Register specifically on you know, some iPad strategies, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. It's not the be all end all. The fact that there's so many technologies on the horizon coming out, the adoption rate of your users, the adoption rate of your advertisers, it's not a be all end all currently. That said though, based on our experiences, you know, even just the last week, there's amazing benefits to this from a user's perspective that uh, from, a, you know, from a publishing standpoint, you have to keep in mind. And I'm sure that, you, know, you in the room that already have these can speak you know, more to this. I encourage you, you in the audience who haven't uh, played with an iPad yet, come up here, uh, try it out you know, after, after we're done. Ask one of your colleagues here uh, if you can borrow. It's, just a, it's a really fantastically elegant application that you know, I think is going to have some profound impacts on your, uh, on your industry. I just wanted to throw out one point. You mentioned print journalism. It's all information, no matter where it goes. Uh, it, 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 there isn't really print online journalism. It's journalism. And, you know, where, wherever it ends up in your hand, on your screen, it's all the same process. Right. So we should stop referring to it as print and online. Can I just ask you, what is that thing that gets delivered to my house every day? <laughs> Uh, it's all it's all information. But it, it ends, that same information is on my website every morning. But that's this thing that shows up that I my wife and I pay for. <laughs> and we're having a debate as to whether or not we should not pay for it some more. And so it seems to me that that is I, I something will, called print and there's something called online, will, but it ain't the same. You will be paying for it. You will be paying for your information or you will get crappy information. So well, soon well, I mean, the I website. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, soon you will be paying for everything. It's a great point, and one of the things we're going to actually bring up in our in our next presentation is looking at print, looking at your website, looking at your mobile applications, and fourthly, looking at your iPad. To your question, what is the difference in terms of content? What is the difference in terms of your readership? What is the difference in terms of how your, how your advertisers are looking at those as, uh, as opportunities? And the evolution of that, I think, is going to be you know, critically important when you're looking at some of these new technologies, because there are inherent changes um, you know, to those models from a revenue side, but also from a content side in terms of what's out there. So. Thanks, Drew. Uh, so some things to keep in mind as we go through the individual presentations about each news organization. So uh, Drew already gave his own lead-in, so take it away, guys. Thank you, uh, 
First of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank in particular the Orange County Register and Freedom for all their time and effort with us over the last two weeks. It's been a fantastic experience going down to see your operations and have lunch with you and, and to have a dialogue that we've had. Really, really appreciate it. I just want to introduce my team. Becca is from uh, the journalism school here. Sarah Vonnen is from uh, uh, Viterbi. And Kevin is also from the journalism school as well. We're going to talk in particular about iPad strategy for the Orange County Register. And the first key point that we want to make is the Register is particularly well suited from an audience perspective for an iPad adoption strategy. Two main reasons for this. First of all, it's a centralized audience in Orange County. 96% of your, your print subscribers live in Orange County. Three quarters of your online subscribers are in Orange County. What this means? You're able to have concentrated interaction with your, with your audience. This is better for advertisers, it's better for your readers, and ultimately better for you in terms of trying to generate different revenue streams down the road. Secondly, looking at the size of the iPad market in Orange County, we built a model, made some assumptions you know, based on adoption rate, based on you know, other key considerations. 20% of iPads sold worldwide are actually sold in California. And so using that number, we, we came up with a rough estimate of 30 to 40,000 iPads in Orange County right now. A year from now, possibility of upwards of 200,000 iPads in Orange County. So think of that number in terms of your readership, in terms of you know, your advertisers going forward, and in terms of some of the, the considerations that we're going to pose for you now. Uh, Becca now is going to walk into some of the, specifically some of the social media applications if and when you move forward uh, with this strategy. So um, right now we have Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, Guala, we have all of those out. And um, online, they all have websites. And on mobile, um, they all have apps. But Foursquare and Guala are specific just to mobile and the iPad. So they all share content for their readers right now. But um, we think that you guys should definitely be an early adopter of Foursquare because that's the latest. So, you know, Facebook is great and it's on the iPad, it's on the latest, but Foursquare applies to the latest. And, um, and we think that your advertisers can benefit from what Foursquare and some of the latest social media um, services have to offer too. Um, we think that geotagging ads, like Orange County is a tight-knit region with local businesses, and I think that you can really reach a direct audience if you geotag your ads based on location, you know, like direct your ads with location so that they're getting your readers where these businesses are located. Um, and then another way that we can use social media in our advertisements is um, the Minnesota Post actually has already started using this, but they have a live Twitter feed into their ads. So here, this um, advertiser bought an ad, and they can update it themselves and keep their advertisement just as current as the content that's going to be showing up on this mobile device as well. So I think that that's kind of the latest in advertising, and I think it's really effective. You can click on the link right there, and it takes you where you need to go. So. And um, basically the point of all this is engagement, and that's really what's going to help you guys um, take off with your mobile strategy and iPad strategy. And Sarah Bond is going to talk a little bit more about that. Hi. So uh, I would like, to, uh, like you to vision and see something what's going to happen in the near future. Uh, Apple OS 4 is coming up, and uh, this is going to provide the average user to have about 3,500 apps running at a time on his iPad. So the key bottleneck and fundamental problem that app developers are going to face is there are going to be so many apps coming through pages. What is it that's going to bring the audience to your particular app? And unless that happens, you have no form of engagement with them, be it content, be it ads, or whatever form. So what I would like to propose here today is the content is the king. You need something that's going to differentiate and bring your users back every day, every day of the week, and on a constant basis. So the iPad is a very good platform, so not being in the print, but then this is how the I see the transition happening from a text-based stuff to a more interactive stuff. So 
the iPad is going to provide you more facilities to get an audio, video, you can get in real time classified ads for own revenue stream and actually land up, uh, help your customers buy the product and get commission out of this. We are going to have, for example, like I mentioned about David Beckham, Trojans, a match going on, you can see real time content, that is very essential. The search is a very important feature that I feel that the OCR should think about because that's the fundamental difference between a print and the online medium, as in the newspaper and the online medium, because uh, people would want to see the kind of content, the relevant content they are really searching for, and they should, it should be up there for them. The online medium provides, the iPad medium provides a nice feature wherein you can have meta tags and links to collect articles of same relevance and present to the audience. There can be interactive ads as such, inter interactive statistics, for example, okay, you, when you say, this is what happened to the Sensex, you can cl click a bit more on it and say, okay, this is the way it went, these are the demographics, this is what. So I feel it's a good engagement and a good transition if you provide nice content from that medium to this. And uh, now we'll have Kevin talk about how to build apps, the do's and don'ts of it. Thanks, sir, Von. So one thing that news organizations can do right now is to change how people get and read their news, especially with the iPad. Drew talked about how easy it is to just look at it in your hands and go and go through it. Well, what, what, the, what you have to do is make the iPad app much better than your website because you're giving everything away for free on your website. So if you're going to, so a lot, a lot of news organizations are asking you to pay for an upfront fee or subscription cost for your iPad app. In order to do that, it has to be better than your website. It has to offer more uh, for the reader for his, for his experience. One thing that, that organizations don't have is the share function for email, Twitter, and Facebook. My partners talked about interactivity and social media. If you don't have that, and if you can't share good, good stories, good information with, with all your friends, then, it, then, it, then you, can't, you can't really spread your word. And uh, Pew just put out a study that said 99% of all links on blogs go to legacy media. 50% of all links, half of all links on Twitter come from legacy media. If you don't have that function, you're, you're losing out on a lot of readership that way. Can you repeat that figure? 99% of all links on blogs come from legacy media. 80% of that is, I think, CNN, BBC, New York Times, and Washington Post. 50% of all links on Twitter, all links, come from legacy media. Another thing that you can do with your apps that, that, that can really draw some readers back to it, video. Right here in the Wall Street Journal, they have a video, they have video right here, straight, straight on the front page, connected with, connected with the story, and it's very easy. Just click play, it just plays right there. It doesn't have to take you to a new page. No more reloading. It's just right there for you, very easy to use. A couple of things that you don't want to do is have obstructed ads that obstruct the print. That, that can really anger your viewers when, when you have to click out of it, or, or right here for Reuters, you can't even click out of it. It's just there all the time, taking away words from, from your news hole. Another thing that you don't want to do is have pictures that you can't zoom into, because if, you, if you've been able to play with an iPad, you can see that there's a high-res picture that is, that is very detailed, that looks great in your hands, and it's very, it's very nice to see when you're, hold, when you're holding it right there in front of you. Looks fantastic and that's something that's, that's going to bring readers back to your app. And the, and the last, last thing I'm going to talk about is what kind of layout do you want for your app? Right here for Reuters, it's very internet based, there's a lot of information right here, but then, it, but then you can't read it on full screen. Right here in the Wall Street Journal, there, it looks like a newspaper, it's very nostalgic for people who, who are used to reading newspapers, and it's very easy on the eyes. So that's a, so that's a couple, of, couple of considerations you want to have before building your, your iPad app. So on that note, I'm going to toss it right back to Drew. All right, so as we draw to close, the, the question is, you know, where to now? And coming back to a strategic standpoint where you guys are now, you know, as, as an organization, the conversation we had with you, there's a lot of different directions you can go. And the way that we kind of laid this out, it really helped us to look at it, you know, from the four main buckets that I just discussed in my Q&A, whether you're in print, online, mobile, or iPad, then three main consti constituencies, your company, your readers, and then your advertisers. And what we did, what we found was there's some commonalities that I think are really important, whether you're going vertically or horizontally. We were looking at some of the, the key differentiators and some of the key commonalities. And one of the things that first stood out was interactivity 
was in every single bucket in iPad. And that's better for everyone. You know, free content. Not so good for OCR, really good for readers. How do you balance these issues? You know, there's no easy answer to any of these. We did some due diligence. We actually called up some of your advertisers for the register. We talked to some of your readers. Uh, frankly, down the road, I think it'd be worthwhile to do it over a longer exp uh, period of time. It might be worthwhile incorporating into, for example, like a classroom experience where you can actually dive down deeper, you know, over a two, three month period to get a sense of how others are actually perceiving these different verticals. But really, the, the, the conclusion that we came to is, uh, you know, the most logical transition is from people in the mobile side to the iPad side. You know, they already have an app in place. They're used to looking at online content mobily. You know, the, from an advertiser's perspective, they're already bought into this. The iPad enhances this. It's a bigger screen space, more interactivity, and so forth. The real question is, what do you do with people in print? That's the biggest jump. And obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, but in the, probably the next five, ten years, there's going to be significant transition from people devoted print readers to devoted iPad readers. There's no silver bullet on what it's going to look like or specific tactics to take, but I think from a long-term strategy perspective, as we say at the bottom here, iPad and other e-readers and other tablets, ultimately better for the register, the readers, and advertisers. And with that, I'd like to open up to any questions. Yeah. How do you present breaking news on an iPad? Well, one of the, one of the things I, I couldn't get into uh, with, my, with my part was push notifications. That's that's a big thing. We, we all we all talk about how important push, push notifications are, especially for an app that come that that is that is brought straight to the reader. And as soon as you open up your iPad, it'll, it'll be right there for you to for you to that. Um, I guess my first one is. Um, you know, what do you think about um, the iPad in terms of how you all were using it for your time that you were on this? Um, I guess the main thing is we know where you know print lands. You know, it comes to your door in the morning and um, you read it then, or you come back at night and you read it the rest of it, or you just put it straight in recycling. Um, <laughs> online, people read that during work hours and mobile. They have it for all those five minutes in between times, but. For the iPad, do you expect it to be a daily use app? Do you expect it to be a breaking news function? Um, all of that, all of the content use kind of depends on when people use it. You know, do they need breaking news from it? Do they need push notifications? Uh, just on that note, like I think people would actually be more sometimes push notifications would be annoying and people, you know, opt out of them on phones. But I think on an iPad, it, they might be more receptive just because they're op they're not opening their iPad, you know, as much as their phone. And when they do open it, they want to know what's the latest and what's the newest. Well, they'd be canceled out because right now there's no history of push, so you wouldn't see it because if you had a bunch of push come through and you, you left it closed, you know, for a couple hours, you wouldn't see it. Right. Yeah, yeah that's true. Well, that's 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 more of an uh, iPhone operating system uh, defect, I suppose, than than, than what your app can do. You can you can work around that a little bit, but but going going to your question though. Uh, I can I can see myself just opening up opening up just flipping through all these stories. I, I look forward in the last two weeks. I look forward to going to these apps and reading newspapers on, or reading my news on these apps. It's a much better experience than on the computer. Um, I might I, I might it might not be for print, but there's some there's some uh, detractions from print as opposed to the iPad. We actually kind of chart it out, like starting when we wake up and when we go to bed, like how we use each each different form. I think you got a similar slide for us as well, but we just kind of went around the room collectively. And what we all found was in the morning, we either look at our phone for news, or we look, when we you know, had the iPad, we'd use the iPad. Midday, you know, 8 to 10, we're at a computer, we're looking at it you know, on the website. You know, 2 to 4, same thing. But during lunch, and before work, and after work, we're on either our phone or this. And really the question is, how do you differentiate from an iPhone? And uh, you know, obviously there's a size issue, there's an interactivity issue. From photos perspective, superior on this. From, in terms of just scrolling through headlines, I'd argue it's still better on a phone. But in terms of having that newspaper experience, like in the, the Wall Street Journal, for example, far superior on this. You feel like you're, you're able to interact with it, that, that feel of the paper in your hands, which you can't get on a phone. And especially, uh, let's just see the way breaking news is operating now. It's all through Twitter. So 
we also did come up with suggestions as to how you can integrate Twitter within your system. And I think that would be a very good idea because you, if you have a lot of Twitter followers, they can see this is what breaking news is. Give up links to your app or your website, redirect, get the information. Should time be spent on the design of a single article or package, or should that be automated? Should effort be put to the look of an actual article? On an on a article to article basis? Um, I actually read an article kind of about that, how this transition to the iPad, like from um, books and newspapers from print in general, uh, is kind of from formless to defined form. And they did a bunch of studies. Um, it, was the, it was the guy who wrote the book Art Space Tokyo. Um, I can get that for you though. Um, anyways. But he said that it made a significant difference. People read more if it was formed for each article and you know, you put your design elements in because you can. You have the screen, you have the medium. It's not like online, it's not just gonna be, you know, straight across with one picture. Like you can make it pretty and make it easy on the eyes and make it really readable. It's a great question. Actually we talked about this a lot. And the question is like how do you do it? You you don't have enough man hours to do that for every article. So what we discussed as a team and with some of the professors in our group was you know, have a certain benchmark that you hit on either number of clicks, number of likes, number of forwards to Twitter. When it hits that, that issue, it's going to be funneled to a specific news editor on your team who specializes in that. All right? So it's telling you that you know, this is a you know, really popular article. What do we do with it? How do we make it even better from a display perspective you know, to different audiences in print? If it's only online, for example, that article should be in next day's paper. You know? um, how do you do that for you know, different landscapes? You can't do it for every article, but if there's a certain you know, benchmark that you have when, when you certain re reach a certain level of popularity, it's worthwhile putting in that, that time. Did you think about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, probably one of the biggest questions with this is not just how to display content and whether we should or shouldn't go there, but it's how do we pay for it. So I'm wondering if you guys have explored what is the ideal uh, advertising model for an iPad app for, an, for a news organization? That is, I mean, that's the key question, the you know, question. and everyone's asking it. I don't know if anyone has a good answer for it yet. The, the way we thought about it was, you know, you got to charge for the app, but, you know, put something in place. Not, not for the app. For, for not the necessarily, content. yeah, for the content on the, for the content, but for, you know, give the app for free, but weave in certain promotions with your print, you know, with your, with your, your mobile strategy uh, to lock in customers long term. Give them a benefit. You, know, you get more benefits with an app if you pay for a year-long subscription in print, for example. And the reason, the reason why, why it's so hard to come up with an answer for the iPad app is because it is so versatile with, with uh, advertising. You can put a video, you can, you can have half the screen, full screens as you're flipping through it. There's a lot of things you can do with advertising on the iPad app. Do you think, um, so you're saying don't charge for the app out of the app store, but charge for the content once they hit the app as a subscription model? That's what a, that's what a lot of organizations are doing. Do you think that that's the ideal solution, or do you think you should charge out of the gate? That's a key question. You know, it's there, again, there's no there's no definitive answer on that. I think it depends on your audience, it depends on your advertisers. Uh, if if there's going to be a transition from the newspaper to mm -hmm. this thing, the key revenue is going to be subscription. I mean, yeah. it it is definitely a fundamental part of the news organizations. And just because this tech savvy new thing comes in, I don't think you should really completely jump off from what your model has been. And so, in, te in technology, a lot, a lot of the saying is that you have to, you have to win market share first before you start making money. Um, a lot of, a lot of news organizations aren't charging anything for, for at least the first two or three months, um, of, of, of their release before, before they start charging subscription model or, or even, even uh, to continue with the app. So you think build a customer base first. Yes. So right. Definitely. Show them, the show them what they want. like the app. So and the way to do that. Love it, then they'll pay for it. Maybe even cancel their print. Overinvest in the app. No. Give it to them for free for a set amount of time. Get them on it. Get them to love it. So you say we take the hit first and then go back and get the money. Well, I mean, overinvest in your budget. You know, it's, <clears throat> it's it's like any new product development cycle. You know, you got to get a sense of you know what does that look like, time wise, budgetary wise. What's our goal from a customer standpoint? And you know, aiming, looking at the customer side, that should be your goal, right? right. And well, because in terms of advertising models. You know, for it to take over print, that's a hell of a lot of money we'd have to make from it. So, you know, to overinvest early on, it it sounds great, but at the same time, to say like, I mean, it's just such a huge gamble because for for us, 
newspapers and print, it's still the advertising models, how you're making right. the, the large line share. Probably sharing. I can do some research up there for you in terms of the QR code feasibility. So that could be one place where your advertisers can be connected on both the mediums. So that would be print as well as online. And probably you can have some kind of a passcode for your print readers. I don't think the, I don't think the fear of having too awesome an app and losing and losing print customers should should be should be something no, that. No, that's not the fear. The fear is to invest in something like this and have it surpass how good our website is would be a huge chunk of investment cost. Up yeah, front. My, my question was, what do, you, what do you want us to stop doing so we can develop yeah. this project? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 you were talking about about this. I guess. When I was hearing your presentation, I sort of felt like you you didn't say it, but you were saying don't ever make your content free on the iPad. And then just now you've said that you should make it free for a certain period of time. And what concerns me about that is don't you risk putting us in the same boat we're in now with our websites, where mm -hmm. we foolish, for, for whatever reasons, well thought through reasons, we decided we must go and go. We tried. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we put our sites out there, now we realize we need to charge for the content, and when we say we're going to start charging, you're going to get huge kickbacks, I mean, huge, huge pushback from, from the audience. Don't you risk that with the iPad, if you give it away free ever? I mean, they didn't give us free iPads for three months, and then say, once you love it, start charging for your iPad. Well, this is, this is I mean, I, I think a lot of us that have used it say, say that this is something that, that's worth paying for, and what, what's going on with, uh, What's going on with uh, not not with not charging for this is like actually I lost my point there. What was your question again? I guess don't you don't you risk if you give away the the content for free for any period of time? Don't you risk having the audience come to take it for granted and then be resentful and you want to pay for it? And especially when you know from the audience's perspective, there's lots of other places to get news. Even though you know we would argue that there's not that many other places to get much kind of news. I think maybe. Um, you should just be upfront with your audience and be like, hey, like we're going to give you six months to try out this app and you're going to love it, and then we're going to ask you to pay for it. And what, is, you know? what is the pricing structure on that? Um, and how are you accounting for Apple's cut? Because okay. don't forget, this is a closed right. platform. Right. So you're automatically losing 30% of any subscription fee that you, you charge. Right. Well, well, for, well, the Wall Street Journal is charging about $18 a month. More expensive than the website plus print. Yes, right. and it's not, uh, and the, um, what's, what's going on with that is um, they're charging it directly from their, uh, from their website. It's not, through, it's not through the iTunes store. So I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if, if the 30% exactly goes to Apple. No, it doesn't, in that case. Yeah. And, well, and there is a lot more revenue streams I feel, <coughs> as far as the iPad is concerned. For example, like I said, you have an ad, you click on the iPad, it can take you directly to a store. People buy, you get the subscription commission right on that, which is not possible through the other videos. So yeah, I do agree that so giving out the online thing free was a kind of pushback. And it is time to draw a smooth transition from the print to the thing. So I think the revenue streams should also follow us. Well. And, and you're always seeing, there are always hearing parallels between the iPad and the iPod with, with the music industry. You have to kind of make everybody readjust their thought when they've get, been getting music for so long they have to get used to play, paying a, a 99 cents per song when they've been getting news for free for so long you have to teach them that hey when when there's a much better user experience when there is video when there is full screen high res pictures that is worth paying for but i think you should definitely offer it like if they if they're already paying for a print subscription then they should maybe get the app subscription they also should get access to the app subscription like in addition to that as they pay for the print. So as long as they're paying for something, that's kind of what you care about in the beginning. The pricing issue is tough. I mean, Tom O'Malley tells us, you know, in our, in our entrepreneurship classes here, selling is easy. Pricing is really hard. So once you have the price in place, then you're able to sell. Right. Are we, are we talking, you know, so, uh, so the, in, in the example you have here for the register, are they going out with $9.99 a month? At we didn't come months. with a set price. I mean, that would that would be a longer term study, looking at price sensitivities of your customers, breaking it down, segmenting it. I think you know, as I was discussing, you know, you know it'd be a longer term, you know, application of what we kind of did here. But it's a, it's a key issue. I mean, if we try to put your put ourselves in your shoes, and that was the toughest question to and answer. You also mentioned that you had spoken to some of their advertisers. Mm -hmm. 
and I won't ask who the advertisers <laughs> were, but I want to know. What, <laughs> oh, okay, you want to know. He wants to know. <laughs> who were the advertisers and what was the feedback that you got? So from our discussion when we were in your offices, it seemed like you're really focused on kind of mid-sized firms, not the Fortune 500 companies, the mid-sized firms, you know, high-end car dealerships in Newport Beach, hotels, so forth. So we called some of them up. It's all done through their, their corporate headquarters. So really, they didn't offer much to us in the sense that, uh, you know, what sort of prices they're looking for, what sort of ways they're thinking about it. The key point from them was, look, we're thinking about it, but it's not in our office. It's, you know, further up the food chain. So what that means for you is, you know, you're competing with, you know, news organizations across the country with this. You're you're, you, have, you have to take that conversation to a higher level, uh, you know, at these, at these advertisers, not at the local ones that you might be used to dealing with for print, for example. Well, isn't it, you know, isn't that more about education for the local advertiser? Education, what, what do you mean by that? We, we, we have to show them how versatile right. they are. I mean, they, yes. were a little, they were also a little weary. They were like, eh, the I, you know, they were just, a, just as you guys are, you know. They're not really sure how they're going to take their ads to the iPad, just as you aren't sure how you're going to sell them. So, so we're going to get to work. really patient people, Robert, please. Um, my question, uh, take away the label iPad and put in tablet and pick away, or, and just focus on the apps. Uh, what I hear you guys saying is make the app better than the website, but when you describe the app, all those features a website can do. So what is the difference between an app and a website besides charging people? Versatility of it, the, being able to take to take it on your hands, being able to... A laptop can do that. A laptop can do that, but, but it, if, you, if you've ever you know, read resume on a laptop, it's got, it's got to sit there when you can't. It's, it's impossible to read in bed. You know, like in, in your in your favorite chair, you can just hold, you can hold it up. I mean, sure. If, if if you have a netbook, if you have a netbook that's light enough, if you have if you have a, a, the, the correct the correct chair and the correct laptop, it will, it will work. It's not confidence mobility. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to. Well, we'll talk more about my app iPad things as, as we go through the other presentations, but we're a little running a little short on time right now. Tom, do you have one last I'm, comment before you? Yeah. Very very short comments. Okay. The cost of getting from where you are to getting into there is less than what you're going to lose because you won't be in business at some point in the future by not making this transition, period. All you got to do is look at IBM laughing at the Apple. You only have to look at a whole bunch of major broadcast companies laughing at CNN. Uh, Pixar was something that Disney should have done and they ended up giving the ownership to Apple by doing it. So I, I really, that's the first thought. If, you, if, if your eyes fixed firmly on the past, you got to run into the future, not back into it. The cost is too great. You will lose your institution. I think the second one, and, and I, I agree with the, and I'm sorry I don't know your name sitting in front of me, but blue shirt. I think that I think the comment that shirt is free, uh, regardless of it, is, is wrong. I think that what this technology thing has done and what entrepreneurs know the difference between is a product and a benefit. And, and the product of the LA Times is it was superior. And I watch my wife read it from cover to cover, but I also watch her get more information off her little iPod. Than anything else. I think that the question that's really here is the nature of the people coming into this into this world are looking for a different type of thing. So the LA Times could give me 500 words or 5,000 words on the right one and I read every word. Um, this attention deficit group of under 30s are, <laughs> you got 17 seconds, tell me the story. And I think that that's part of what journalism's not accepting as they look to the future. Thank you, I've talked too much. Right. <laughs> yeah, can I ask one more question? I'm sorry, but I know you, so I could jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Just real quick, buddy. When you looked at the look and feel of the product on the iPad, you pointed out Reuters as being very web-based, and you pointed out Wall Street Journal as being very newspaper-based, but did you think about whether or not there actually is a news product that should be iPad or tablet-based that wouldn't look like a newspaper and wouldn't look like a website? Because we kept getting back to the newspaper being on a tablet, but but we don't want to put a newspaper on a tablet, do we? Don't we want to find the tablet, the, the tablet delivery tool? Are you seeing the associated press app? Yes. That's a different way of presenting. It's a very interesting way of presenting. It's, just, it's, well, it's, it's all, it's all headlines. There's no, there's no subheadings. Right. Head, and you kind of, when I want to go through, I kind of feel like I'm guessing at what, what the story is about. I think the, I think the Washington Journal, though, it looks like a traditional newspaper. It's really designed for the iPad, like you click on the article and the article blows up in front of you. You're not reading it and then you know flipping through to find the rest of it or reading the whole article on one page, like you get to see the lead of every article in that section 
and then you click on the ones you want to, and I think that's awesome, like just touching it and watching it expand and touching the pictures, touching the video, You're right. I think that's what makes it different. Getting to back, real quick, getting back to what Robert was talking about, about mobility, and, and it's, 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 about re it's about reading experience, like when, I, when I'm reading, I find myself just getting used to just constantly scrolling little by little as I'm going through the story when, when the entire page is right there. And, and so, you, you kind of scroll once you're done with the page instead of just little by little after every sentence, like on a website. Great. Thanks, Rick. Great job. Thank you. All right, Laura, well, I know you had a question, but your team is up next, so. <laughs> So hi, uh, my name is Joe. Uh, this is my team. This is Dominique. Uh, this is Viv, and you already know Jason from earlier today. First of all, we want to thank uh, the LA Times for talking to us and showing us around the office on Monday and spending some time with us. We also wanted to thank all of the people who helped to make this happen. And in 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 the time that we've been studying mobile, uh, when I when I was going in when we were going into this, we were looking for that. Holy Grail, that magic app, that silver bullet that was going to solve all of our problems. And what we found was, you know, there is no such thing. There is no Holy Grail with a picture of fruit on it. Uh, what, it what it's about is we have, mobile is about strategy. Um, you have your websites, which we've heard about. You have all kinds of different phones. You have your tablet, which is being used right now. And uh, the idea is, how, you know, what are the best practices to push across all of these different mobile platforms. And so to do that, we looked at what are the top, you know, the advantages uh, and the intrinsic characteristics of mobile devices. And uh, we looked at a Pew report that came out in January about the participatory, participatory news consumer. And what they taught us was that phones, first of all, are portable. People carry them with them everywhere they go, which means you can reach them wherever they are. Um, these things are also uh, personal. When people use their phones, they like to engage, you know, they're trying to get to the content that has the most value to them. They want to get there quickly and they want to get there in ways that are comfortable to them, with them. And it's also a participatory experience. People like to engage with their mobile. It's not flat. Uh, the basic idea is the more toys you give them to play with, the longer they'll stick around. The key here is to engage audience. Now, the LA Times especially already has a huge audience just on your mobile website alone. I think it's 18 million unique visits a month. And so the idea... 25? 25? Sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the idea is uh, to get them to readers to really engage with the content, that the readers you already have engaging with the content you're putting out. And Dominique's going to talk about that aspect. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. We can go to the slide. Um, so the challenge now is figuring out, figuring out not only how to attract more customers, but also how to retain them and keep them within the app. So um, by doing so, you're able to create a stronger brand affinity as well as getting them to stay, to have more page views, and also to stay within the app. Um, I think the advantage of having an app is that people are not, unlike a laptop, they're not really browsing through like many other tabs. While you're in their app, you're in the app, and you're, captiva you're captivating their attention. So with this, um, the LA Times, people go to the LA Times really maybe two reasons. One, because they want hard news fast and they want it constantly updated. Or two, they want to be entertained, they're on the go, maybe they're waiting for their mom at the airport. So with these two attitudes in mind, um, we're offering several different features um, that take advantage of the interactive aspects of a mobile device that you could potentially use. The first is an expansion of your social media. You do offer people the opportunity to share on Facebook whether they like an article, um, but we're proposing that like a widget on a website, you have within an app a section where people can see what their Facebook friends are, look, what LA Times content they're looking at, and what they've liked. The second is an option to thumb up or thumb down um, an article, whether they think it's newsworthy or not. This allows them to immediately con contribute as well as see the results of that. So, the Daily Beast actually has something like that currently on their website, but we're offering it as a feature on a mobile device. The third is being able to save content, um, so an S right there. Um, so this keeps people coming back into your app. This gives them an incentive to keep coming back. So probably they're on the go, they probably don't have time to finish reading the article that they're reading. So by having that option, you're giving them the opportunity to dive back into your content. 
The fourth is being, up, being able to upload content. If you give consumers that option, um, it gives them, it, they already have a, um, a sense of belonging to the neighborhood that they're in, so um, they can contribute to your LA Times mapping project if you're able to offer this on a mobile phone. And these features can be easily implemented and maybe inexpensively Im implemented through um, with databases and articles and information that you currently have in the LA Times. Um, I'm proposing that you could do something really quick like a top five or top ten list that people can instantly, you know, quickly browse through and also provide like these different features with it. And the second is it allowing pe or having content refresh on the LA Times app um, according to which neighborhood you're in, because you've already built this LA Times mapping project. According to your location, you can see your content or you're arriving into Westwood. You can have news content pop up on your app according to where you are. So the next step would be implementing user engagement across all your mobile platforms. And the benefit of doing so is that you can get information to your consumers when and where they want it, as a lot, and also allowing them the power to engage with your quality product. And by doing so, you get to enhance a two-way dynamic relationship with your consumers. One important aspect of user engagement is geolocation, um, which Jason can tell you more about. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, Dominique talked about getting more user engagement. Geolocation is also going to get user engagement. However, it's, at the same time, it's also going to generate some revenue. So it's kind of, uh, I think it's the best part of the presentation. Uh, and geolocation um, can be implemented into most phones today. Uh, a lot of the phones today that you're using have GPS in them. Uh, using a, a provider, I could imagine that a couple thousand dollars would get you guys a geolocation feature on your apps or um, website, possibly. And using using this feature, you get first the benefit to the reader. The reader gets a benefit in that they get personalized stories according to where you are. So ex imagine that you're in USC or around USC and there is a bomb threat going on at USC. Uh, you would get the, the story right up here and you might even get a push notification as well. And this goes uh, along with if the user wants to look up a restaurant near where they are, they, they'll be able to look up the restaurant or possibly even uh, look up local um, other establishments. Um, the next, the next uh, benefit to geolocation is you can also get benefits to the advertisers. By having geolocation, the advertisers will help able to get a more segmented audience and have a better, uh, better value for each advertisement. They'll be able to pay less, target a smaller audience, and don't have to pay for the whole audience of LA Times. No one wants to pay for it, or maybe some, some companies do, but most local companies do not want to target the whole audience that you have. And geolocation will be able to do that, and using that, we can have very localized advertisements uh, of a small restaurant on, on a small street, and you can get a free drink if you come here, and that's going to give uh, uh, more revenue for the Los Angeles Times as well. Now I want to bring up Viv, who's going to talk about personalization. So, well, we talked about the two P's of the peer report. And now I'll talk about the third P, that is personalization. As Jason talked about the geolocation feature to integrate the, uh, uh, to track our audience on the basis of their location, I'll integrate this feature with the third P, personalization. So how are we going to do that? So we are trying to uh, segment our customers on the basis of three things. First, uh, their characteristics. Second, their purchasing behavior. And third, sorry, uh, purchasing behavior. And third, their preferred content. So what we'll do is a small survey, a small kind of survey, which will, when we, uh, when we go to our, website, our website or an app or anything, a small survey with three small questions asking their uh, age, gender, income bracket, what they like to purchase, what type, what type of content they want to read. And now, here's the thing, how we want to monetize on that thing. So what we'll do, integrating the location and the, uh, the general info of the audience. And uh, this ad over here, which is a generalized ad, becomes the personalized ad, targeted ad. And uh, 
for the generalized ad, if, we, if suppose we are charging, I'm giving a generalized uh, example, for 500, pe uh, 500 people, we are charging our ad company for, for $1. So we are generating revenue of five, $500. But for the specific audience, for the targeted audience, suppose targeted audience is of 200, we can ch easily charge our ad companies for like $4 each. So here our revenue grows up by $300. Now we are getting revenue of $800. So basically to increase revenue, uh, segmentation is the best uh, tool to do that. And uh, Another, another feature I would like to suggest is the de uh, device detection. With simple HTML coding, we can easily detect the device uh, of the user from which they are logging in. And now this ad over here becomes the um, mobile, mobile company ad or service provider ad. So there's a huge scope uh, for the iPhone and Android to put their display their ad over there. And uh, just say if a person is uh, logging in from the feature phone. So, uh, they can see the ad that up, uh, upgrade your phone to iPhone or Android and boom, click. They're clicking and they, they'll get their iPhone and Android, something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so here we covered three P's and now Jason, uh, sorry, uh, Joe will tell you about the fourth P. Yeah, we came up with a fourth P. Uh, we call it partnerships. Uh, we've given you a lot of technical, uh, technological innovations and ideas very quickly. And one way to accomplish those, especially when you have you know, barriers to innovation, including the limited resources everyone is dealing with in newsrooms these days, is to partner with people who are already doing it. There are companies, uh, one that I came across is Ad Local. They can help you implement a geolocation feature that, um, you know, in terms of segmenting, you know, in terms of pushing out your advertising, that also gives you metrics for your site, even real-time revenue statistics for the ad that you're pushing out. So, um, It'll, it'll, you know, in meeting with people who are already doing this and evaluating the various assets of your partners, you might be able to collaborate to, you know, essentially grow your own company and grow your own operations in mobile. Another kind of collaboration we hear a lot about is, I, I call them service collaborations, like, well, should the paper collaborate with Foursquare? Well, uh, when we look at that, you know, we heard about, I think it was the Wall Street Journal pushing out the notification about another bomb threat, this time in New York. And, uh, you know, and what we sort of envision, and we can talk about this more, is, uh, you know, people checking in. Why is it that when they check into a place, they, have, they don't have access to the existing Times database on, you know, this was the last restaurant review we did here. This, you know, we have an, an events database, you know, what's happening at this location today or tomorrow. Um, the third kind of partnership we wanted to talk about actually relates to the iPad, and it's about goes to Lori's question about how do you really get started with that. Um, one way to look at it is, it's kind of a partnership, look at your existing customers. Um, let's say I saw Jason Penny the other day, and you can imagine, uh, and a big advantage of the iPad is, you see JC Penny ad, oh, here's a blender, I want to click the blender, here's how much it costs, here's what it sounds like when it's making a margarita. Um, you have lots of existing companies with these flyers that, you know, with these ads, you know, the Thursday ad supplements that come in the paper, those things interact really well on iPad. So what we would suggest is to go to the customers you already have, especially ones who might already be interested in this technology, and start developing it in a way that they become almost a guaranteed revenue stream that's going to be funding the building of that application. Because the Times website already looks pretty good on the iPad, the functionality. As we heard before, there's a lot of other stuff you can do in terms of really bringing the content out and using a technology, HTML5, the new evolution of coding. But, um, you know, that's all details. Uh, so thank you, and if you have any questions, we'd like to open it up. You mentioned Ad Local. I did. Uh, is that a mobile server? Um, I, believe, I believe it is. There's a, number of, there's a number of companies. Ad Local was actually just the first one that pops into mind. I'm tweeting a link to it right now. They, they use, uh, they use that, that, you know, what was interesting, and when I was researching these companies, you know, to look at what they were doing, wow, well, okay, well, they're doing, you know, specific, they, they were doing a lot of the ideas that we already came up with, implementing geolocation and that. And it's not for us to say you should partner with this particular company. That would be right, no, a right. deeper investigation. I know, just, but just because, you know, in terms of ad networks, mm -hmm. you know, what is the CPM on that? See, that... So, I, I believe that that seem, you know, because they're not just giving that away on their website, I believe it has to do with institutions, and I believe that because you're the Los Angeles Times, you'd be operating from a specific position of strength. 
that other institutions that they're used to dealing with that are a lot smaller probably would not. Yeah, there are two different kinds of mobile, well, actually three, but there's two main ones of mobile ad networks. One is a blind network, which is kind of um, just kind of blasting out all kinds of ads, right? Then there's a premium network where the advertiser will pay more. And often, I was looking at this online, and um, premium networks tend to give a larger share of that revenue to the publisher, for example. So that could be an opportunity to look into. Yeah, and even like if, 60 to 65 percent. Right, back. and even if you decide to give your give a programmer two days and four pots of coffee to put the geolocation code into your app, I mean by studying what these people are doing out here and their processes and actually talking to them and seeing what they offer, that would be a way to develop a specific strategy. Um, you know, an implementation and execution of the kind of overall strategy we're talking about today. So same same question I asked before. What's What's not just the content way forward on iPad, but what's the, the ideal advertising model? Um, I don't know if you guys looked at a bunch of different iPad apps. I think Explanatory did. advertising seems to be, if I had one word for it, um, it explanatory advertising. Uh, we looked at, there's a demo on YouTube of this HTML5 coding that uh, Sports Illustrated is using. And the most interesting part to us was actually, I mean, it looks really pretty, but they have a Canon photography app. It's a picture of a kid playing baseball and you click on which lens on this camera and you can see the closeness and the definition of the image and how that's different. Sort of a, you know, it's definitely a how-to. And they even have a feature where, you know, using geolocation, you can say, okay, where are the stores nearby where I can go physically see this product, maybe even buy it. But, but I guess I'm thinking more so than what, what can the ads do for the customer is more what's the advertising model. So if we were to spend the money to develop an iPad app, is it we partner with one per, you know one business and sell it that way with banner ads? Is it that you know that each article has something different on it? Should we target many advertisers? Um, well, each uh, we can say each section. As I said, that segmentation. So we are segmenting customers on the basis of also on the basis of sections. So suppose if somebody is interested in reading the business news over here mm -hmm. and clicks on the uh, business news, so there's a whole news over here and the uh, ad over, uh, up over there becomes uh, something like business airfare deals for, uh, for you. So it's like we are segmenting the customers and the ad and also uh, we are providing three and actually I got, suddenly I got fourth feature also in mind that click to call, where to buy and save for later and fourth one. Uh, can be related uh, related ads. So like this, we are not only giving the single ad over there, but by clicking on the related ads, we can uh, see all the uh, rest of the airlines who are providing same uh, same kind of deals with different uh, airfares. So you're yeah. sort of suggesting with those that each ad becomes its own mini marketplace Maybe. where people can start to exactly interact and uh, can rather going on the XPD or Travelocity, they can just click on that ad and look at the airfares and what are the deals they are providing. Besides um, segmented mobile ad advertising, um, I think another thing that we had been talking about was getting the money up front from a sponsor to fund an iPad app or whatever. Or it may be a yeah. group of, you know, you got JCPenney targets. Similar to the way the New, New York, York Times, Times, Times has Chase. Chase. Right, exactly. let them put, because they're going to want to have a role in developing that ad, so let them. I doubt they had a role in developing, they're, you know, they're probably the launch advertiser, yeah. um, but on, um, you know, they developed that app probably in the context of saying we're going to have a single sponsor. No, I mean in the ad that they produce, there's a relationship right. between the, the, the organization and the customer. And by starting with that relationship, not building it and seeing who will come, but actually finding your customer and building the app around the needs of that customer, just standard, you did know, you, as if it were a startup company and stuff. Did you look at any uh, additional ad models for the mobile? I did, um, what do you think of subscription models? Oh, subscription. Subscription in terms of what the Either iPad apps specifically or, or iPad. apps. Well, this is basically for a website or a website. If we take an account for app, the so app uh, subscription model should be low. It, it should be like 0.99 or 1.99 because uh, major players in the news industries like Fox News and um, I can say New York Times, they're providing their app for free. Re uh, really, they're providing an app for free. Then why the person pay for uh, 4.99 or 3.99 for um, uh, any other news organization if uh, they can get the major players for free? So, uh, 
providing the app for uh, lower price, but uh, generating the revenue from the advertisement, from the personalized ads and targeted ads, is, uh, is basically our approach, our strategy. So, don't use a subscription model? Um, uh, I'm not saying provide it for free, I'm not saying provide for 3.99, but for the app, basically, we can get from 1.99 or 1.99. Um, I'll vote for 0.99, but... You can't push, to, I guess what we're saying is, you know, that would involve deeper, deeper studies of kind of customers' behavior, what's on there, but you can't push them too hard because the free culture that sort of infected the internet has already made its way into, into mobile as well, especially with, you know, other papers and products and throwing stuff out there for free. If we were to move forward with these sort of targeted ads, how do you suggest that we educate the advertisers, which is also a burden of our sales force, as to how mobile ads work? Like, what would be the steps to... Well, um, first of all, we need the very basic analytics uh, to show the advertisers that, okay, we have, suppose, I'm just giving the example, we have 1,000 people, 1,000 general uh, audience, and 200 of them are of the, of, of the age 20 to 25. So, and out of that 200, 100 are interested in looking at the uh, restaurant, uh, restaurant deals and uh, things like that related with the food and restaurants. So now we know that 100 people and the chances of those people converting into the customers are very, very high. Rather than taking from the 1,000, the probability and chances are very less, but from that 100 is very high. So we can provide our ad for the higher prices, as I told that uh, if generalized uh, for generalized audience, we are giving for one dollar. This is an example. For the targeted audience, we can provide for four dollars, five dollars. And ad companies don't knows that uh, this, uh, there's a high uh, chances of converting customers. So obviously, they'll pay for this. Well, I mean, you you have to look at the the, the top of the funnel. Exactly. Because in this in this example, I don't know where this place is. But no, this is what generated by Jason. Hypothetical. What is what is the top of that funnel in that geographic, if we're doing by geolocation and we're serving ads by geolocation, mm -hmm. well, how big is your funnel? We just try to uh, increase the chances of the audience converting into the customers for our, for these ads. So what we did is we are we including geolocation and the general info, and based on that, if a person is near USC and he's interested in uh, food and uh, uh, going to restaurants, then this ad will become the free drink near USC area, some, somewhere near Figueroa or some, somewhere like that. So obviously there are higher chances for that audience going to that place. And I see it, uh, part of what might answer your question is, you know, if you look at the existing customers that you already have, I mean, you know, with that ad, you know, hey, in addition to the business you're already giving us, Target, when somebody gets within a mile and a half of your store, we're going to you know, you can directly reach them on their phone because that's the ad that they're right. going to see. That model works with Target. Uh, you know, I agree with, with Target, JC Penning. Right. But when you, when you get down to this micro level, the funnel up here yeah. is only going to deliver X amount of people. Mm -hmm. So the ROI for that is the, the, the cost for that advertiser has to be so low that, you know, to onboard them into the network. Mm -hmm. So, if they're paying, you know, a hundred bucks for this ad, right? You know, they're not going to make their money back because only one or two people are actually going to walk in there based on this ad. How well, who would walk in there based on the print ad? Um, that funnel is a lot bigger because of the daily, the daily. Uh, that platform reaches many more people. But the only times it's going out to that many people, but not that many of them might be right where the restaurant is. But the funnel is bigger. Not, not enough people get it. Don't get in the door. Right, but and you the, know. And the charge is larger. And your cost basis for selling that ad is larger. I got that, but you know, they're still not going to make their money. That this model, you know, this micro advertising doesn't work. It well, just doesn't. The question we had was about the institution, about how it's worth it also, you know, with you guys selling this and, you know, starting it at that top of the funnel with the <coughs> existing customers you already have. I mean, if you can say, you know, if, I mean, it's, if you're sending the ad to everyone, like, you know, a lot of uh, mobile websites do, 
you're making what, a tenth of a cent per view. Um, I could see, because there's only going to be 10 people who happen to walk by that day, you know, 50 cents. There per can month. be other models too. For very localized businesses, you could have a click per view or a click, click per, and then you can have a lot of providers just get 2,000 local businesses. And then every day, even if so you use five of them, the uh, Google model of exactly or the Obama model of a little bit from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I, this idea of One more question. actually almost like its like own community products. Yeah. Where where you know I can buy the full run LA Times, or I can buy just the you know Westwood Zone. Blend right. news press yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. And and again, the catch there is that. You pay a lot less when you buy the community paper. Right. You reach a lot fewer people. Um, but you're cash. also charging more per right. per advertisement, though. Not. I can see. Well, I can way. see the, the, the specific value statement that comes up for customers. Let's look at uh, Rick Russo's two projects. You got the Grove and the Americana. If I'm near Glendale, I'm going to get the Americana ad. If I'm near the Grove, get the Grove ad. Because if I'm on the 405, what's the sense of getting me really the Americana in the immediately at mobile, you know. I can see great values just from the customer standpoint, but my concern is like for the ROI, the, the amount of the amount of work that it takes on, on our part to, mm -hmm. to set up that ad for every little restaurant that wants to have that ad and know that it's only going to reach a small number of people. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And um, we will in effect give these ads away. Really? Because of the 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 investment and effort that has to go into it. We'll start at the, I would suggest starting at the top of the funnel, see how this works out for Target, McDonald's, uh, Ford, you know, especially the information, people, demographics, right. like to buy a it car. It works for those mass mm -hmm. advertisers, right. Subway, uh, you know, take this coupon right. in for $2 off at Subway, where Subway has a huge right. footprint. Right, when you're near a Subway, you Correct. Comes up. So that's, that mm -hmm. micro for the mass works, yeah. but when you, when you get down to a smaller advertiser, that becomes a really, it, it, it just, the, the economics do not work. But it's like, it's not just a single advertisement. We are providing the related ads also, and if a person clicks on the related ads, it will get the whole list over there, uh, what, what kind, what kind do of- Do you click on related ads? Or do um, you browse ads as if they're content? Well, if I'm interested, I yes, I do. If, if it's like um, airfare to India for just thousand dollars, obviously, right. I'll be, 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 like, yes, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to London, and I was looking all through ads for Great Ferris to London. Yeah. Never found one, but um, <laughs> That's true. but you know what I mean. It's, but it's everybody looks. But if I'm on I'm on this device. And in a use case like this, if this is on the mobile site, it starts to break down. So my question earlier was, did you look at perhaps doing a deals and offers feed that actually doesn't run in a display advertising spot, but it's a section on the... Uh, like you opt in at the home page? Right. It, yeah. it, it runs as part of the content flow. It's part of the feed of the the site. Mm -hmm. uh, it's labeled, of course, as advertising. Of course, because yeah, it has to be transparent. But it it connects people in a low cost, low effort way because it costs. It does. There is a hard cost to everything that newspaper news organizations do, whether it's on the advertising side or the content side. So. It's about making it as low cost, low overhead as possible, but still connecting you. Where we were focused was, you know, looking at, at in a sense at the value chain. How can we increase the value of the ad for the customer? How can we create increase the value of the ad to the audience? I mean, they're getting ads as content in a way that's relevant to them. Uh, Not as content, but, but I still need to make money off of that. Right. So let's, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm the sorry, relevancy, I need to cut this off because we're running really late right, right now. Uh, uh, well, Robert, 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 you mentioned companies that are involved in creating technology for geotargeted hyperlocal advertising. Um, and, and we got on the idea of this as local ad networks and we were part of our local ad network. I'd like to suggest that you have another option that's usually off the menu and they never mention, but that you could actually just do a technology buy from them. 
or you don't have to be part of their network, so they get cut up very hard. You just say, I'll pay you this amount of money up front, and you're going to give me your technology, and I'm going to have my people implement that. Because you're absolutely right. <coughs> what you have to do is you have to automate as many of these smaller advertisers as possible. But if you've got the technology in place that you then control because you bought it or licensed it, right. then you don't have to worry about giving that local or anyone to cut on this thing. So that helps make the value proposition minus the expense proposition come out to be in the black. And on a corporate level, I mean, if your organization is large enough, you just go and say, hey, we're just going to buy you outright and take the technology and we're going to move forward. There are dozens of these businesses out right. there yeah. that right. you should right. Thank you very much. <laughs>KPCC and a CPR. It's been a really great experience these last couple weeks. So Alex and Jeff and Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to show us around your fabulous facilities and, and talk to us. We did a lot of listening and I think a lot of learning and we're really excited to share with you some of the ideas we have for the ways that um, public radio is uniquely positioned to really capitalize on mobile technology and mobile strategies. Um, to start, I think we should talk a little bit about how public radio is different. When you listen to public radio, you really are part of a family. Membership is such a huge huge aspect of what makes people support what you do and the content that you deliver. And we feel that mobile technology is going to really um, encourage uh, your existing listener base to continue to support you. And it also presents a unique opportunity to engage uh, a new demographic of young and potentially more diverse listeners um, through smartphone applications, improved websites. Um, so with that, uh, I think we'd like to um, talk, Kevin's going to talk a little bit more about uh, WAP site specifically, not repeating too much of what he said earlier, we want to move this along because it's getting a little repetitive at this point, so Kevin, take it away. All right, so we did have the luxury of a brilliant presentation earlier about how to address <laughs> WAP sites. So now I would like to put that to use a little bit. Can you, mm -hmm. just just highlighting some of, some of the key points you can see here, we mentioned quick reference data points at the top. Here you can get the weather, and with added functionality you can get the five-day forecast. Here's the traffic with all the highways that we all know very well. But we recognized it was very important to address the needs of the core audience. They want to hear the live audio stream. Now on a website, that takes up a lot of data. We all are educated on the problems with too much data on a website. So here we very plainly delineate what number they can call to listen to the live stream. Here is that ever-important search button so they can sift around the website with speed and ease. They have the programming schedule here, which is something they might want to know as well. But here, another navigation point. And what we thought would be important is a button, the En Espanol button, that quickly converts the text to Spanish-speaking language customers if they so choose to speak in Spanish. Here you can see what an article looks like. On the top, the headline, picture, not too large, still under the 20 kilobyte limit. The time, the author, we have three comments. Um, so we can see how many people are commenting on it. And then we have the ever-important share button, with now surrounded by red. Email, Facebook, Twitter, if they'd like to do that. They can also post a comment. And we're thinking about adding a percent commented to see how popular people are interacting on that, if you want to join in on the fray. And then back to the home page if they want to quickly jump to where they originally were. So that's a website. We uh, have the luxury of a graduate Viterbi student who has a network of other graduate Viterbi students. So instead of doing a mock-up of an app, this is an actual app that Tehran and his friend Anurag built for KPCC. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you sent the bill yet? <laughs> <laughs> so 
surprisingly, it took him like less than six hours to do this, so <laughs> he's a genius what he does. Uh, well, yeah, uh, so just to start with, uh, yeah, uh, like Kevin said, we wanted to make sure that, it, I mean, it's easy to say this is what the app should look like and do it on a PowerPoint, but it's completely different if you have the functionality on the Android. And we built this for the Android because he knows the Android really well and it's the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, to start with, uh, yeah, so, so the, the basic functionality that any app should have, and this is something I heard someone mention earlier, that a WAP and app, like, you know, I mean, what's the, really the difference between having a website versus just having an app? They're two completely different things. I mean, you, you cannot compare a WAP to an app. An app is simple, it's, it's easy to have on your phone, it's faster, and most importantly, an app should, and this is something that we're doing with our app, it should exploit the features of the phone. A web doesn't do that. A web is simply a website on your phone, but an app has the added functionality of being able to access your camera, your GPS, etc. And that's something that we have integrated with our app. I mean, it's not functional on the current one, but we're still working on that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we have a few features here. Uh, for instance, the contribute button, which I'm going to let Keaton talk about. But apart from that, uh, we have uh, stories. It's basically just the, the the title, the contribute button, the I mean, uh, I remember Alex telling us that the thing about radio is that you need to have that, you, you want to keep your listener, listeners, they like to have live radio, so we have the live, uh, listen live button right there, so you can start listening to streaming radio. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, you have the uh, headlines which pop up, uh, the, this picture is not updated, all right, uh, and then you have the categories, so that you can select, yeah, I'm sorry, you can select the particular categories that, that you know, you may want to jump to, uh, it's in the form of buttons. Apart from that, we have the really unique feature of the friends card, which again, I'm gonna let Keaton talk more about. Uh, you can, of course, of course, listen to the podcast while you're browsing, and that's something I think which is really important, because you may wanna listen and you know, look at other stories and scroll while they're doing it. So this is something that exploits that feature. Uh, yeah, so when, <clears throat> when you click on any uh, story, it takes you here. Uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and explain real quick. If you wanna go back to that, uh, this is the evolution. Of, uh, this was our first draft. Uh, as you see, our second draft has the incorporated weather, traffic, uh, and a few small changes. General idea is the same. This is actually the more uh, uh, more matured page right here. Right, and, and as, as, that's actually something really important that you know I'm just going to go off what Keaton said. But uh, this is the most important part about any app: is that you need to start simple, put it out there, see how people respond to it and then start building on it. Don't just add all the functionality that you need and just put it out there at once. You don't know how people will react to it. So me and my friend Anurago, I wish you could be here, but we started with this and then we started building things into it, like the feature to have the weather and the traffic updates on the, on the main page. And then if you can go, uh, uh, no, next slide. This story. Yeah. All right, well, Okay, <laughs> if, you, if you click on any one of these uh, headlines, it takes you uh, into the story where you have a uh, thumbnail and then a summary followed by uh, the story itself. You have share options. Uh, I, I'm going to show this around later on the phone. Uh, you have share options right there. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's a hand holding it. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, th the reality is we had, this is our first iteration of the story, and in, in, in true uh, developer fashion, we said, hey, can you do this? And he and Anurag went overnight, and they switched some things up. That yeah. picture was not inserted, obviously, here, but this is a little iteration of it, and you can point out how it might be different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is the initial one, but we've changed it now. What we've given is an added functionality to be able to change the font size, which I think most uh, apps do have these days. So we've added that in the latest version of the app. The share options have been moved up uh, below the uh, headlines, uh, and we've also added a little, little uh, uh, tag there which says how popular the story is. So we have something that shows you the, no the number of percent of people who actually chose to share the story versus the number of people who read the story. And that's something really important if you want to measure what kind of stories are getting getting more traction with uh, the group. Uh, I think that's that's about it. I'm going to let one uh, thing, Ashley. Yeah, one thing you'll notice here, and we heard loud and clear from you guys when we were meeting with you, is that public radio listeners are very um, Part of the reason they listen to public radio is because it's not commercial radio. They don't want to be bombarded with advertisements. So we were really careful in designing this to really avoid um, throwing a lot of um, advertisements at uh, your, your users. So that was some of the thinking there. Um, however, mobile, we believe that mobile giving and fundraising via mobile is a huge potential pool of money. And it's specifically a, a great area for public radio to get into. Um, you guys don't have advertisers, you have sponsors. People want to give money, they donate, they support this family that they feel that they're a part of. Um, and the way we use mobile to kind of target that group 
is really by setting up easy ways for people to text to donate, um, text to give, call in to support, etc. Um, there is uh, 2.4 billion, people have spent 2.4 billion dollars in this country on purchases via mobile. So that money is out there. 300, 300 billion estimated globally by, 213, by 2013 will um, be purchases via mobile. So um, this is a huge pool of money and, uh, and you guys need to get into it. We want to tell you a little bit more about how to do that. So Keaton's going to take it from here. The contribute button is how you do that, uh, in short. And what you see here is when you click the contribute button, this is the next page that pops up. It allows you to register or to log in as a registered user if you have an existing uh, SCPR membership online, in which case you can uh, renew, you can make your monthly payment, you can make a one-time payment, you can do anything that you would be able to do on the website. Uh, if you're a new user, you can be prompted to register to do so, um, or you can just take the simple click to donate option, which will send a, a text in five or ten dollar increments, and this is a service that's going to cost ninety-nine dollars a month. Uh, we think that's pretty reasonable. We'll, we'll be able to make that up. Um, it also allows for a second texting option. This five to ten dollar increment is called text to give. Text to donate does not have a limit. Uh, people can donate as much as they want, and it's it's a practice that's really been proven in in a live environment. So on air, this might work. Um, at events, it's been proven to work really well. One of my friends with a uh, healthy child, healthy world campaign at a dinner last month raised twenty thousand dollars with this in eight minutes. Uh, you say, let's get this going. Text five six seven eight whatever it is um, with your number. You know how much you want to donate. Let's see how much we can raise. And people people really love engaging, being a part of that, feeling part of the community, seeing what they can do to help, and watching that, watching that matter. Um, so get folks into the Crawford Family Forum and start Crawford talking to them about sending text great, messages. But, you know, you have, you have a running dial or something. Monitor <laughs> <laughs> up. You know, uh, and our second option that we're excited about, well, if you go to the website, uh, we, we also allow for this on the website, which is great because it broadens your audience. You know? it, it allows everyone who's on a phone to become a mobile member of KPCC. It allows people to engage and interact in the way that mobile phones just really foster. Um, and, uh, and it's a great way to get people started. You know, it's not asking for $120. It's saying, hey, you know, you, do you appreciate this story? Mm -hmm. I mean, send them a little tip, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing things like that. Um, so it, it, it's versatile, and it, uh, it brings in a whole new demographic as well. You know, these are young people. These are people who are not inclined to call in, maybe doing a, a donation drive on air, but who are very open to using their phone to just do, to make a quick transaction. They may not be inclined to spend more than $50 a month on a phone bill, too. So being able to give only 5 or $10, and if they could know maybe that it's going to be matched by one of your donors or supporters, they may be very much more likely to do that via mobile. Right. It's, it's an attractive option. Um, if you go back to the application, uh, then we have another thing that I'm very excited about, uh, which is the Friends Card implementation on a mobile device. Currently, this is the Friends Card. This is the Friends Card on steroids. <laughs> uh, what I'm inclined to do with this friend's card is forget about it. And what I'm inclined to do with that friend's card is act on it. Um, so it puts right into, like we're talking about earlier with geotargeting, with uh, location-based offers, puts the offers and those benefits right into the hands of your mobile consumer. So, for example, uh, Avanti Cafe um, or any of the other hundred or so partners that are part of the friend's card program, might offer 15% off, approves to $25 or more. If you're within a six block radius, define it however you were, the, uh, will, that's, that's an example, then a bunch of cafe will pop up and you might say, hey, that sounds great, or uh, you know, a free taco at Mama D's, uh, that's, that's wonderful, if it's lunchtime, we'll go get one. Um, that's not actually just a hypothetical, that's something that's been proven. Um, on, on web advertisements, we have a click-through rate generally between two and three-tenths of a percent. Um, on mobile advertising, it's close to 50 percent. 50 percent. Actually taking an action. Uh, that's a study that you can find on amdmobile.org, just published last month. Uh, just enormous amounts of interaction going on when you put a geo-targeted ad or, or offer sponsorship right into the hands of a mobile user. So I think this Friends Card program is a great way to really stimulate engagement, get people involved, get people excited about being a member, being part of that community, and also having this added benefit at their hands also uh, really adds a lot of value to those sponsors that are being a partner 
in the Friends Park program. Mm -hmm. It's great for them. Um, and I think we'll move on. The goal is really to build membership here and, and also find ways that you folks um, can talk, can collect data on the folks that are going to be donating to you via mobile. So we need to grow those donors. If you get them in on a $5, $10 text, we want to make sure that in uh, this application that you can um, get some more information on them and follow up with them later on and, and kind of grow that, that base. And if you're not a member, uh, but you see all the members that do have this app are getting these great offers, yeah. getting this, this really cool experience, might be able you to become a member. So you'll see on the friends, the, the banner on the on the application, you'll see, oh, you could be getting 15% off of Avanti Cafe, but unless you can log in, you're not going to get that benefit. So it kind of promotes this kind of, you want to join our club, a, you want to join our family, and, and we're going to take care of you. you. As you see and, and what's not evident on the on the app, um, but can very easily be developed by by uh, Tron and Honorog is what you see here where you have how your contributions are being used. So you know, why am I sending $5? And these may not be the top five, but those were some quick five that we identified. And then there's a call to action at the bottom before the page break. Want to become a mobile member. So it's kind of a new type of membership. What do you get from that mobile membership? It's a more personalized mobile experience. Um, you can save stories. You get those local discount updates. You can get text updates on breaking news. It's, it's an opt-in feature that they can have by just you know, donating five dollars, maybe ten dollars, and it hits the type of uh, diverse audience that uh, we think is valuable for, I'll, for SCPR. I'll jump back real quickly to uh, another smaller but still exciting uh, opportunity is that when you have a login on a website uh, for mobile members, or you have your app for anybody, whether you're logged in or not, um, you can use search, or in our case, circ. To uh, <laughs> <laughs> 07 PowerPoint doesn't go to 03. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, actually categorize your top categories. So right now, when we define your categories and tell you that you're interested in world, business, local, politics, um, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm really listening, really interested specifically in LAUSD. And so I search your site once for LAUSD, and then you can, uh, this is just a coding thing that you don't see on the screen, but I'm gonna explain it. Uh, you can just set that as a new category. So now LAUSD top, pops up as one of my categories that I can click on in every story that KBCC has ever published. The uh, steel will be in there as they come in. Uh, new stories will will appear in that feed. That's a, that's a cool feature for mobile. Um, it's it's interactive and it's customizable. It's personable and it's really usable. Uh, you know, it, it makes it more enjoyable and more useful experience. So really, I mean, what what all these recommendations mean to you? We can touch a little bit on some of the ideas we have for for uh, creating an ROI and monetizing it in the question. Uh, period, but really, this what we've recommended addresses the feature phone user. Uh, we have a website that works for them. It addresses the existing core audience. They have the ability to listen to the live stream on each of these, um, whether it's the application or the website. Um, we are able to address a more diverse audience. Uh, on top of that, um, there is a different type of contribution mechanism. There is it, it enables more spontaneous, maybe unsolicited contributions. Um, that you don't have to do while you're on the phone uh, or while you're in front of your computer. You can do it via the, the push uh, or the touch of a few buttons. Uh, on top of that, there's a new type of membership you can have. You can move some of the existing members to an additional mobile membership, or you can have folks that are just mobile membership because that's the type of membership they want. But we also think there is a unique value that can be delivered um, to partners, uh, to, to underwriters, to, to consumers um, via the geo-targeted. Um, coupon or discount information service, as uh, we'd like to call it. So we would love to open it up to any questions anybody might have. Actually, uh, three what we consider the three uh, main operating systems: BlackBerry, Android, and iPhone. Uh, our particular developer, who has expressed interest in going forward and working with you, if you do want to do that, uh, is Android specific. Um, and so we'd still have to look for people to develop iPhone and BlackBerry. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'd still have to look for people who work on uh, the uh, 
the operating system for uh, the OS X and, and no, the, the, the for, for BlackBerry. Yeah. 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 Are you talking about apps mm -hmm. or websites? Uh, apps. apps. But wouldn't the, wouldn't BlackBerry wouldn't the uh, uh, website satisfy the BlackBerry users? Might yeah. I, 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 that's a, that's something that we have yes. to consider. I mean, I'm going back to your initial presentation, right. Taryn. Yeah. Right. So I'm just sort of just to be clear. Uh, website would satisfy the feature phone users right. and possibly also the BlackBerry users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, you're right. There's there's a good chance that they would be satisfied. But it, I mean, if if it's possible to make the app, I don't see any reason why not. To. The difference with the app is really the promotion of membership. That's the whole you know being able to really target them and have them log in, have them become a part of of the family. I get that. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the... how do you basically satisfy the major operating systems. Mm. So. Web would be for the feature phones, and then BlackBerry. Are you saying website or a BlackBerry app? I would say both. <laughs> both. That, yeah. And then the Android app you demoed and the iPhone and app the would have to be the one that we have would have to be expanded to mirror the Android app features. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Got it. Okay. Which version of a, of of a BlackBerry would you target? Would you go for more of the the bold and the curve, or would you dumb it down for some of the older Blackberries? I think for the older blackberries, uh, we would stick to the website. I think that's a that's a smart idea. But for the newer ones, I think we should go for a. I would, I would think about tours and curves and, and yeah. uh, storm to the lesser extent. In, in terms of the other operating systems, I mean, Palm is out there. Um, I mean, but they were just bought by HP, and it's pretty volatile over there right now. I would wait to see exactly what happens with that walled garden that they're trying to create over there. Yeah. And I think that. Uh, Symbian, I mean, they've dabbled in trying to do smartphones, but they've been overpriced and lack functionality, so mm -hmm. I would stick to mm -hmm. a website for any Symbian. Makes sense. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the value proposition for mobile, for mobile members. Why exactly do I become a mobile member? Well, I mean, you're able to access news um, and personalize it, so um, you want to be able to do more than just listen to the live stream that's currently there. You what do you mean by personalize? Well, you can set up what we talked about, the different categories. You can uh -huh. set, if you search a term, USC, uh -huh. you can make that as one of your categories uh -huh. that you first see before that page break. Okay. Um, and it's a premium feature. It's a premium feature. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't, you're not paying extra for it. But. Well, you're paying for your annual membership, and then, and that's what you, yeah. So you, first, you have personalized yeah. search terms. You have this mm -hmm. friends card program. You have the friends that's card being program that you yeah. get access to. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the, the same thing that you I'm get from... Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to sell it, right? So right. what do I get? I get personalized news, I have my own search terms, mm -hmm. I have permanent searches that's so run, running for USC or... And I, um, I full SCPR at, at my hand. You have the now. same value right proposition as SCPR on the phone. I can't read a local SCPR story okay. with much ease right now. So if I'm not a mobile <laughs> member, what do I, so I can't access the application? Though? No, you can't access the You can't access the application. You can't access the application. You okay. don't have uh, the personalized search terms as a category editor, uh -huh. and you don't have access to the Friends Card benefits. Got it. Okay. You guys have questions? Yeah, talk a little bit about getting people over the apprehension of doing financial transactions on mobile. I guess the texting is, is part of that solution. Texting is basically been proven to work. Okay. Uh, you know, Forty or fifty million dollars. Over from forty Haiti. million dollars for Haiti. And so, I mean, with that understanding, we can get enough people to text in five and ten dollars. But I we really wanted to spend some that, time, yeah, um, talking about when you're when you're donating more on that, uh, you know, hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, if you want to do a thousand level, you can do that on that text. That's why it's we're hesitant. We didn't put it in the app, as you saw, uh, mm -hmm. but it has been proven to work. In, in person because that kind of it makes it more comfortable you're all sitting in a room together you have uh, somebody that you trust up on stage and, um, and the way that works is actually you get a phone call back within 10 minutes after you text that donation in and um, what you would likely do is have a voice recording of the you know one of our popular talk show hosts saying asking for verification of it um, and then people either via operator or keypad uh, we'll key in the information to verify that purchase, and it's comfortable when you're in a setting like the Crawford Family Forum, and we can all do it together. And uh, you know, it's this big movement. It's a little less comfortable in an app. That's why we did not include it there. There, uh, there, ha there has been some texting <coughs> done with, with text to give in public radio, and it has not it, with micro donations, the, the five dollar and, and, and less types of donations, and it's highly dependent upon your presentation of it and whether it's tied to broadcast or standing alone on its own. Standing alone on its own, it didn't do very well. 
What do you mean standing alone on its own? We're, we're just putting a link on their, their website mm -hmm. to text to, to give, mm -hmm. give them a small donation. In, yeah. the, in the experiments that it had been done, it, it didn't have much click-through, but it had more click-through when on air or on the stream, it was supported by somebody saying, go now and click to yeah. give a micro donation. And that's oh, the beauty of public radio, that you have that kind of direct connection with your listeners, that when you put a call out like that, there's real power. Um, and, and the key being that a lot of times when people are listening to NPR, they are on the go. So that's where the mobile phone comes in, and that's where the texting is really going to come through, we think. And, and I think that uh, those studies are probably based on a different audience than what we're proposing you can acquire. Mm -hmm. uh, I think feature phone users um, will have a greater propensity to do it if it's there, especially if they're new. It's the only thing they know if they're new to, to SCPR. So I think if, if you're able to um, diversify the type of audience that maybe those studies were based on or those trials were based on, then I think the jury's still out on whether or not it'll work. Now, have, you, have you looked into usage versus um, an app? versus a website of, it, of, of media businesses in general? Are the, is there a broader adoption of the, the, the apps than of people just going to the websites? Or over time, somebody who has an app on their phone, they start downloading other apps, that gets lost. And, and the value of having that, that advanced app disappears, whereas the website is always kind of in their bookmarks on their phone. Well, I think that you, you have to have a strategy to reinvest in the app. You have to have a strategy to, to update it. I mean, I have maybe 20 apps on my iPhone, but I feel like every day there's something that's being updated. And I, don't, I don't propose that SCPR needs to do the same thing. Well, what, are, what are the updates to this type of app over time? Tron? I mean, updates, <laughs> that would be completely up to you, right? I mean, I mean, for instance, right now we're still working on the, uh, the geotargeting part of it. That'll be something new that comes in, but those are the basic features. Uh, of, of the app itself, so we, there would be redesign of the app, but again, that would that would just be to increase engagement. I mean, if you're if you're asking me if there are going to be radical new features that are you know going to come into it, that depends on technology. Mm -hmm. If it improves, there will be. If if not, then it's you know um, it's going to be the most content mean, that's going to be updated. To say real quick, I don't know if there's media wide statistics on that, um, but there are plenty of apps that I've downloaded and deleted after I use them once. But the ones that are good, I reliably go to every day. Um, and, and so that's up to you, up to every specific organization to have a, uh, you know, a, a good enough app that people do return to it. It's, it's not a problem with apps in general that they might disappear or get lost. It's a problem with your app not being up to par. And that is uh, one more thing about the website. I mean, that is why we started the presentation with the website. Because if you have a good website, that's basically like having the good website on your phone. And people can go and continue to do that. No, we're not saying the application is going to replace your website, you know. I think the nature of Jason's question is more reducing the number of environments we have to target. Because if we're talking about apps for iPhone and Android, we can target both of those browsers at the same time because mm -hmm. they're both forked from WebKit. Mm -hmm. We can't get the camera, but we can get geolocation, and we can get a lot of that stuff. So I think the nature of his question is, what research do you guys have on if you don't know that there is an app, you don't have it yet, and you come to our website, we can tell you about an app, but we could also just make that the experience and what kind of data do you guys have on the likelihood of people to continue through that process when they realize they have to go install something before they can have the experience? So you're talking about if if you want to take it's the, the argument is just put have an iPhone and an Android app or have a website that targets those devices. What what do you guys what was the thinking between those? The, I think part of the thinking I don't have a complete answer. I, I'll admit um, is that. The WAP has to, and that is the website, in my opinion, that's going to be uh, best for really any phone. Um, it's going to be something that needs to be able to load on a Nokia, on a Razer, uh, and, and if you're making a website that's able to load on a Razer, it's not going to be one that I'm going to have a great time using on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's where the need comes in for both, to develop both simultaneously being uh, a great mobile website and a great application for higher end smartphones. I love the focus on, on membership, and you clearly listened when you met with our membership director. And um, also, we have a pledge drive coming up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just mentioning it. We so I feel that our station marketing is working, but the dirty little secret about public radio, at least for public radio stations, bigger ones like us, is that almost half of our revenue comes from corporate sponsorship. 
So, um, and you know, once we venture and we, um, we undertake this mobile plan that you so eloquently outlined for us, I'm going to have to present this to our senior managers team, and there will be our director of membership, but there will also be the director of underwriting, which is our term for marketing, for advertising. <coughs> What would you like me to tell her when I show her that app? Then she asks me where the ads are going to go. Uh, through the Friends Club. You can, you can extend that program, yeah. bring in more sponsors that want to be a part of that. Uh -huh. It's an incredibly valuable resource for uh -huh. businesses, for arts and cultural centers, restaurants, the like. Uh -huh. um, so you can increase that pool of what we have right now is something like 100. Uh -huh. um, and people that do want to uh, kind of upgrade from the card in my pocket to the phone in my pocket. <laughs> That's definitely going to take the form of a higher cost. Um, you know, yeah. which, whatever they're paying to be a part of right now is, is not enough. I would think she'd be very excited because then she can go back to your existing sponsors and say, hey, well, we we've got this very thing now. So what you're, say, you're saying is, is, is advertising mm -hmm. is, is, is not just a presentation of an ad, it's an interactive mm -hmm. tool now. Yeah, and it's an offer too. Because uh, you know what we know about SCPR listeners is that they are what 88 percent more likely to support a business that supports SCPR. Yeah. And uh, you know rather than just an advertisement, this offer of 10 percent of free, you know, nothing or whatever it is, uh, yeah. it is a tacit endorsement, it, and that's yeah. something that's going to propel. Sorry. That, that's going to propel them to uh, go support that business. I think. Uh, we you could probably set it up initially as more of a cost per action type revenue model to establish how well is this succeeding. So they click on an ad, or they click on this, hey, heads up, 10 miles away, there's 20% off, or for the next day, there's 30% off you know, uh, opera tickets, and then they're sent to a screen that's set up by an underwriter that's either a, a code word or a number, yeah. and then they go, when they go to purchase, they give that code word or they give that number, and that underwriter writes it down, and you, you want to incent them to write it down because you can say, hey, we want to see if it's working and what's not working, and then you get a healthy percentage revenue cut because that is something that they want. They want a cost per action. So it's not necessarily, they're not going to pay up front a premium for that CPM. They're just, they're going to pay for results. Yeah. I think it's very smart. And I, you're clearly thinking about action. And what makes advertising more effective on mobile phones is that people can take action right there and then. But there are also, you know, some of our clients that are perhaps less consumer focused or maybe we find a foundation like the Knight Foundation who wants to pay for our iPad app and we want to have a nice logo <laughs> somewhere on the screen. So I think we, we may have to think along those lines, along the lines of just display advertising. Well. Or you could give them an option. You say, hey, yeah. here's your premium. Yeah. Here's the numbers that support the actions that come. Or we can try this where you have less upfront investment. Mm -hmm. But if it works, we're going to take a percentage. One more question. One. You guys decide. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I have comments. Okay. Um, you guys have been there are only a handful of apps making wish I had an Android phone, and this would be one of them. Cool. I just want to say it's pretty impressive. I want it on my iPhone. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Karen, from a development perspective, is HTML a realistic option for developing native apps cross-platform? Do you know? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. That's, I, I don't have any comments about that. Just Reverend, do you, do you know? Uh, so I think the HTML5 Suppose the standard called the Hedge 264, mm -hmm. as far as video is concerned. And uh, yes, about two months back, before Apple brought up this whole Adobe war, uh, the Flash video occupied 99% of the market. And today, that has the unique Flash videos occupy only 33% of the market, whereas HTML and Hedge 264 have risen up to 66%. So I see a scope wherein there is going to be a lot of transition. And as far as Flash is concerned, it is definitely a heavy software and it's going to drain out batteries. So anybody who's looking at portability as a factor is will certainly prefer HTML5. Robert, you're on. <laughs> I love the emphasis here on sharing and social media and interaction for uh, mobile applications. But what I've heard so far, applying that editorial content. Let's not forget that we can apply social media to donations and to advertising. That's so when you donate, uh, have the option to send a message, I just donated $5 to KPCC. Would you like to do so too? Boom. I just 
took advantage of this friends car offer mm -hmm. on KPCC. Would you like to take advantage of this too? Would you like to sign up? Take a look at it. Yeah, a lot of people, next some week. companies, uh, I mean, I didn't even think about it until now. I do know companies that uh, ask to pull Facebook information, in which case they'll post it on my wall. And, uh, but when you're looking at these type of local advertising, let's not forget, I mean, the power of Foursquare right now is to take individuals' commercial actions within a defined space and socialize that out to a group of friends. So if you start applying that same thinking to the high political advertising you have on your website, so people who are interacting with that but then telling their friends about that, mm -hmm. that's a way that you start extending that funnel mm -hmm. that we talked about earlier, making it larger so that the value proposition versus the expense proposition begins to work. Thank so you. really be thinking about social, not just for editorial, but for advertising and business as well. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. First, I'd like all the students to stand up and take a huge round of applause. Do you believe they did all this in like nine, what, not less than what, 11 days, 12 days or whatever. So it's been only two weeks and they did all of this research and met with all you guys and I really appreciate all your time. And as, all, as you know, um, or as maybe some, I've mentioned to some of you, we are thinking about making this into a class in the spring. And I, I do have this laundry list of things that apparently we're going to do for you guys. Uh, for, the, for freedom, I guess, you know, I think one follow-up step would be to do more research, especially on the Orange County iPad audiences and advertisers that the free group already started. Um, and we can then perhaps reveal names and things like that. Uh, for the Times, I think it'd be great if we could uh, join with uh, Marshall and really look at some of the micro local mobile advertising aspects and rate structures and things like that and perhaps you know, subscriptions and what have you. And of course for KPCC we need to get the Annenberg Innovation Lab, right Roberto, together on um, working on that Android app um, perhaps in partnership also with KPCC. So uh, I, before we go and break for lunch where we can continue all these discussions and I know all of you have all kinds of questions more to ask the students and each other and what have you. We would really like to thank the faculty on this program. Um, Amy Guerin, our, our mobile news expert, the, the corner of the term crappy mobile, otherwise known as lean mobile, Dani de um, she's just been our inspiration sort of like on thinking entrepreneurially and what have you. Robert Niles and Tom Amalia, our, again, our, our, um, our entrepreneurial thinkers and our business thinkers. Vicki Porter with Knight Digital Middle Center and of course, our leader, Geneva Oboser. So again, applause to all you guys as well. Thank you.